Part 1. The Dark Sea There is a time when one can no longer look at the sea as they once did. You see it for your first time and you're amazed. You see it again, and perhaps you're amazed, but you can never return to see it for the first time again. But if you go to a new land and see the waters around a distant island, you'll find that though you've seen beaches, caves, coves, and rocky shorelines, it is different. There is a presence upon the water, a spirit to the seas, an undying force that binds all upon the rocks of the world. The ocean is an unending source of power and emotion, a place where words and imagination converge in a way that is not quite like any other. Valrin stared at the still seas passing beneath them. It was like glass and dark, almost as dark as the clouds twisting above them. The winds were cold, a welcome change to the otherwise mugginess. It had been two days of near-perfect flight, with no sight of anything, just seas and clouds. In the far distance was the rolling storm of Misla, the lightning flashing around the walls of clouds, veiling what was beyond. It was constant, but moving away from it. Valrin found some level of comfort in this, as strange as it was. He knew there was no escaping what Misla brought, but he still didn't understand it. This sand cow is nearly dead, Melia said. Yeah, we attempted to apply more salves, Ilera said, but Evern said the creature is more of metal than flesh now. It is literally breaking apart. Ordok has taken to making a device he believes will allow him to jump from it. Valrin hadn't noticed what Ordok was doing, but turning around, he found that the half-orc had constructed a large blanket with two ropes looped together. It's like a sail for a ship, he said. I can jump out, and it will carry me down, holding the wind above me. Aveam just shook her head. Ordak, that will not work. Come now, you have your magic if we crash? What are we to do? I know this will work. It's two different sizes of cloth, and it's uneven, Alara told him. I do not need negativity. I need support. I'll support you, Evern said. See? A good friend supports his other friends, unlike some of you. I'll support you by pushing you out early. Perhaps if we lose some weight inside the sand cow, we won't have need for whatever contraption you've designed. His words were a surprise to Ordak, but it was all in good fun, or so Valrin hoped. Ordak sat down and continued sewing. Valrin looked back out to Misla. He could not believe that this was like another Ayeklo from another realm. He saw it as stone because it was still coming into their realm. He didn't understand exactly how time travel and the bending of realms worked, but he knew Morag had to be defeated. As the others continued to bounce between the windows and ignore that they were indeed slowly crashing, Valrin went up to Radahala. The genie looked at him as he climbed to where he had been staying most of their journey. My friend descends, but we are on the verge of reaching that which we've been trying to get to. The shanty village, it has a name, but I do not recall it. A storm comes upon the oceans, growing in ferocity from the western glacial seas. The genie pointed out opposite of Misla, the great storm that had many times seemed just on their tail, bursting with lightning and billowing dark clouds. It moves with us as if Dimon guides the storms to push back Misla. Thankfully, Valrin said, Misla is far from us. It will turn. It seeks you, Stormborn. It is why we could not get closer to the temple of the Saint of Dimn. It was toward Misla, drawing Misla closer. It will all make sense in time. Valrin touched the lost captain's compass and then rolled his fingers over the eye of storms. I'm trying to understand how all these items will help me. My intent is to get my ship back. That is of the utmost importance. The ship is but a part of things when you have gathered that which is here with us, and there, where we go. He pointed ahead of them. Then you will have what you need. Valrin noticed a single tall wall ahead of them. It didn't look like a mountain island, but a flat stone wall. He noticed a slit around the middle of what was ahead, 
because of a bit of sunlight coming through from the other side. This was where they were headed, and not a moment too soon. A fire erupted on the side of the sand cow, followed by an explosion of shattering crystal. The entire sand cow began to rattle and shake, as for the first time ever, the creature bellowed and moaned as if it were in pain. They were moving faster now. As gas was expelled out of the back of the creature, it looked for a moment as if they would fly directly into the stone wall ahead. But instead, they went down, the entire sand cow turning as if lying down before water splashed around them and Valrin was thrown into the ocean. He kicked, pushing up, seeing that Avium was already at the surface and Ordak was swimming, still grasping his sewing material for a reason Valrin could not guess. They had landed in a deep cove just off the island, and though the sand cow was breaking apart and sinking, they had nearly landed in shallower water than Valrin knew was here. He found his way to several large rocks, and one by one, the others popped up from the depths. Valrin looked behind them at the massive wall. Seeing it closer, now he realized the ruins high above them, but below, near the base of the crack in the stone that opened up near the bottom, he realized that the lower portion of the island was open to the other side. He saw rows of huts made of stone and wood, with larger buildings made of larger stones. There were several fishing boats rowing toward them as he now turned his attention to pulling Evern out of the water. Next time, don't crash the sand cow, Evern said plainly. He did not, Radahala said, floating by them. He simply was present when my friend gave up. It is simple and fortunate that it happened here. Now, we look forward. We look toward the others. Radahala floated down to the ground. His clothing shifted from the bright colors he wore before to a more somber hue of brown. He moved his hands about his face, and it seemed to Valrin that his face changed just slightly. You use strange magic, genie, Avern said. Do you not wish for them to know who you are? No, these islanders are skittish. Most are simple enough, and if you look simple, they will embrace you. Besides, I need to look like a ruffian. That is what the lost captain had upon his ship. The fishing boats arrived. One of them had a large man with broad shoulders. His hair was short and black, and he held a large trident in his right hand. What happened? What creation is this you crashed in our waters? A sand cow of Ayeklo, Radahala said in a deep voice, very unlike anything he had used before. We were coming here to look at the ruins. These others are my hired bodyguards and laborers. I seek to look at your ruins. I work for the mage's school of Fadabrin. May I speak with your governor? There was a burst of low laughter among the other fishers. No governor here, he said, leaning on his trident. We serve Meridas. He protects us. He sends fish to our waters, and his priest watches over us. These words caused Radahala to have a loss for words. There was an awkward moment of silence when Melia stepped forward. You are the Eastern Rock Pirates, she said. Pirates? What pirates? the man said. We are simple fishers. I am Melia of the Silver Swindlers of Ayaklo, and this is the Eastern Rock Island. I have heard it described as I see it now. We are not your enemy, but a bit of honesty goes both ways. Now this brood of a man was silent. Perhaps we can discuss this off the lone rocks in your bay. The winds are cold, and I'm sure we could both do well to not get sick while we discuss who is telling the most truthful stories, Valrin said plainly. The man who had been speaking to them looked back to the others. Head back ahead of us. Advise him that they are not dwarven pirates. One of the boats turned around, and the two men on it began paddling hastily. Melia of Ayaklo, I know you by reputation only, but I am Karak, just a fisher here upon Eastern Rock. We will take you all to shore. He looked over them. Quite an interesting selection of bodyguards and laborers, he said to Radahala with a small smile. 
Valrin and Melia were the first on the little boats, and Nevron and Alera were whispering to one another. Are you coming? Carrick asked them, holding a spot on his own boat for them. Yes. Keeping the sea fish away? Avern asked them, referencing their dragons. Yes, don't spook the eels, Nevron said. Melia looked at Valrin, who was partially convinced that some of his crew might have hit their heads if he didn't know better. The boats were quite small, considering what he was used to, but in truth, even the Aela Sunrise wasn't that large of a vessel. These were fishing boats, as simple as one would expect. He wondered about Melia's mention of them being pirates, but he believed it better to just not ask right now. Though Valrin and his crew were more than capable to help, Karak and his fellow fishers did not ask them to paddle. Valrin looked around more at the island of Eastern Rock. The area they were in was a narrow bay, protected from the tossing ocean waves by large black rocks that formed a harbor of sorts. The water here was deep and clear. He could not see down to the bottom, but he saw the lights of glowing sea creatures of some kind far beneath them. The winds here were constant, blowing upon the rock grass that grew up the sheer face of the slab of stone he had seen as a wall on their approach. But all this aside, it was the sudden sight of broken wood upon a long stretch of rock coming off the island to their right that drew his attention. At first, he thought it was just driftwood, but the longer he looked, he realized that it was not driftwood at all. He saw the broken ornate railings with just slivers of silver visible, the center mast of a grand ship, and two larger poles splintered and broken into one another. He saw the helm and a black wheel further up. The vessel could not have gotten there from the ocean. It was too far up, unless, of course, it had ridden upon the back of a large wave. Then he realized this was the ship of the lost captain, and this was the island he had chased the wizard to from Radahala's story. The odd part to him was that the ship, though he had never seen it in his entire life, looked somehow familiar. His thoughts were thrown off as the hull of the ship pushed up against the sand of a beach. While some of the boats went directly up to a dock, evidently, they were not so lucky. As Valrin and Melia were met by a welcoming party surrounding a man with long silver hair, the others began onto the docks, walking with Carrick. The man with silver hair had a long beard kept in a braid, with tiny seashells in the scruff. He had a staff of shell, and upon the end of it, a large open shell with a blue orb. Karak went to introduce them and report to this man, when the man lifted his hand to stop him. This one and these people are known to me. By the glory of Meredas, I bring these to you as you requested. They call us pirates, and the short one, he said, pointing to Radahala, says they are here to look at the ruins. Does he? Well, I say take them to the main hall. The sea stew should be ready, and I saw the quality of herbs going into it. He kissed the air. It will be wonderful. He bowed. I am Makli, priest of Meridas, guardian of the eastern rock island for many, many years. I watch over our god seas from the region of the east. Valrin, your name and your crew are known to me. I was told of your coming in a dream, and I would much like to speak with the stormborn of the glacial seas. I do believe there is much to say between us. He outstretched his hand, and Valrin looked to the others of his crew. Do not worry about them, Mackley said. If there was ever a place that the Stormborn and his crew could safely rest, it would be upon my island. They will be well cared for. I'm not much for gods, Ordak said, but I'm quite interested in this sea stew. You go on, Valrin. We'll save you a bowl. Valrin nodded to Ordak and looked to Evern and Aviam. I'll be back. Mackley smiled as Valrin walked toward him. They began to walk in a different direction than the others. Valrin looked back and saw that Radahala was looking toward them. We will take the ocean path, Makli said. Keep the attention to a low amongst the islanders. They turned off the main road and down a shell-lined pathway 
that led toward another small cove and closer to the ship of the lost captain. Well, we'll get right to it, Mockley said, stopping on the shoreline. The Nakri, the rage of Eastern Rock, our protector and the vessel of Captain Maro Tua. Valrin didn't catch it at first, but then he realized it. The name. Tua. That was what his aunt went by. While she wasn't his aunt by blood, it was a strange coincidence. You know that name? Makli asked. I do. My adopted aunt. She went by the name Tua. Tua is a shadow elf clan name, but Maro was not a shadow elf. I cannot say why he chose such a name, but he was a follower of Meridas and Wura, though of the latter I believe he felt indifferent to. Maro was a man of the sea, with ties to the sea people of old, or so the stories go. There is much rumor to him that has been made well known and adds to his legend. So, he was a Dwemhar after the flood? He was a survivor, saved by Meridas, or so the tradition has been passed down to those of us who wield the staff of the sea. We were charged with protecting these waters after his fall. It is I who stirs the primordial icy depths to ensure our seas stay cold, a charge I have faithfully taken. But as of late, the seas warm, and I wonder how much longer the powers of this place will remain. He smiled, looking to Valrin. Stormborn, I want to show you this. You alone are allowed into one of the sanctums of the sea. Come, come. The man led him up from the shoreline to a large opening in the rocks above the cove. This was no simple path, but one that snaked around large boulders with sea glass in piles, tossed by the changing tides against the rocks. Several hermit crabs moved slowly over the glass, and at least two seabirds sat nearby on a rock, watching the crabs. As they came up to the cave entrance, Valrin noticed two small crab statues at the entrance to the cave, along with two turtles. Turtles are the messengers of Meridas. If one comes upon you in life, it is deemed your life has been blessed. Happy turtles, he said, touching one of the statues. They followed the passage into the darkness, Valrin feeling the cold stone around him as Mackley's staff began to glow. We have only a bit of darkness before we step into the light. It is a truth of life, no? The priest laughed at himself again. At this point, Valrin was beginning to think that the priest was a bit mad. Not that he considered madness necessarily a bad thing, but it was an honest observation. That being as it were, as they came into a large room with torches set in the sea, rock high above them, and the open sky even higher above through a narrow opening at the top of the chamber, he forgot about that. Instead, he remembered entering the sacred area when he first met Meridas. It felt like so long ago, but it really wasn't. Now, standing with Makli, the priest of Meridas, he felt a similar stirring in his chest. They walked down a path of shells and out onto a precipice that rose above the water. Looking down, Valrin noticed the churning dark seas beneath him. This was no pool or cove. This was a place of power, and though he could see the sky above, the winds snapping through this place ensured that if someone were to try to enter it from above, they'd be torn apart. Between the sounds of crashing water beneath them and screaming winds above, he could not help but feel as if he had stepped into a hurricane, minus the wind shooting around him. Here, Mockley went on, is where the glacial seas and the eastern seas meet and exchange power. I have felt the presence of another, a great fog upon the waters, and I know it is not of our realm. That is Misla, Valrin said. It is why I have come to this island. Yes, Makli nodded. You seek that of Captain Maro Tuanakri, the parchment and his ship. I do not seek his ship, but I do seek the parchment and the horn. I have already claimed two of his items. The Eye of Storms. I was given by a priestess of Dim, and this, he said, showing the dark compass. Makli smiled with a sad glare. I knew you were coming, but I did not see it as it was, not at first. 
I did not take you here to just show you this place, but to speak to you of Radahala. I do not wish to speak ill of any saint, but he is one I thought dead, as I'm sure he thought me dead. Are you not allies, serving the same gods? We serve gods of the north. Wura is well known as a trickster, not that it makes you less godly, but it does lean toward evil in certain lights. The gods have their purposes. Kel ensures the warriors stay strong and rewards their bravery. Throka is less involved than the others, but he forges the weapons of the gods. Meridas rules the sea and ensures life continues across all of the living realm, while Aether has been a champion of the original races, protecting them and overstepping as it has been written. But Wura, he is like their sneaky little brother, doing what he wishes, playing in the night sky, making a show with the polar lights. His servants, too, are less than great. But he is a saint. Is that not higher than a priest? Mockley laughed. Well, you'd sure think so, right? Most saints have done something of regard for the gods or their flocks of people who worship them. I have not failed to carry out my deeds here, but a priest I remain. Even after I pushed back the sand cows that once came here seeking to kill me. He smiled with a wry glare. Sand cows? From Iclo? Sand cows loaded with all manners of fire-causing substances flew right into the main portion of the city. Thankfully, I was able to use the sea to push them back, but many were killed when the oils leaked from the sand cows and caught fire. It burned down the library of the Merida's saints, but I wasn't in there by my own fortune. But who showed up to claim protection over my island but Radahala? He has wanted access to this place for so long that I wondered if he'd soon come under another name. He changes his name and appearance, but when I saw the sand cow coming down into our waters while expecting you, I knew there'd be a twist to this. Valrin nodded. Neither I nor any one of my crew have any ill intent, but I cannot say for sure of him. I trust him, yet I do not. He tells the truth, but typically with some form of lie or omission. I believe something else has always influenced him. Marok. That is what I have thought. Marog is not a name that has come to me. Is it of this Misla? Yes. Makli sighed. Then it is not that. You see, Radahala has existed for a few hundred years. He has come in different forms, but well before this fiasco upon our seas now. Either way, you are a guest here, Valrin. The ocean roared beneath them. I will show you what I do here and then I'll reunite you with your friends. You have my permission to enter the ship of Captain Morrow, but I will warn you that getting to it can be quite precarious. The path was washed away. I am sure we can figure something out. Valrin winked. Makli lifted his staff as he walked to the edge of the precipice. The mists beneath them began to swirl up around the priest, moving up and down in an almost playful fashion. The winds began to twist above him. In the waters far below, the dark sea began to spin and surge with energy as if jets of water were exploding underneath the surface. The air snapped colder than it was before, and Valrin could see his breath. Macleys lifted his staff, and the waters far beneath them rose in a fury of waves, tossing within one another, ice forming on the top of the water. The air filled with a harmonious hum. This restores the seas, ensures that the realm of Meridas is kept safe, and brings glory to the living realm. The oceans are but a measure of our world's well-being. The warmness that has overtaken parts of the greater ocean is like a sickness, a malaise to our god. I do my part to protect what I can, as do we all. Then are there other priests like you across the ocean? Yes, there are several. In most cases, they hide. I doubt you knew of this place until you arrived here. I didn't, but I felt like I recognized it, like it was a familiar place to me. He looked up, staring out at the sky and shaking his head. But I know I've never been here. No, you haven't, Mockley said. But memories can be strange, transient, changing. When your mind forms a memory, it forms an image of it within you. 
I'd argue that we are not always the best at recalling that of the past. In some cases, you may even contrive what you believe to be a memory, but you, as you stand here, could never have been to that place. You speak of a past life? What, was I the lost captain? No, his spirit was sealed away. Valrin remembered this, but he was more trying to jump to what the priest was getting at. But I do speak of old souls and new. You're an old soul, as the gypsies of the Shadowlands would say, a spirit that has been upon the world before. Your destiny has not been completed, and you must complete it. Well, I'm the stormborn captain of the Glacial Seas. My purpose is to help one in Erlas, as has been revealed to me so far. But is that all? Is that all of your purpose that your soul has? I was born an orphan to serve a purpose. We all must serve a purpose. If only we all had that choice, Mackley said. Come, follow me this way. They took another path out than what they had come in through. This one looked the same but felt different and went to what Valrin guessed would be the opposite side of the eastern rock island. I have no choice in my fate, Mackley said suddenly as they made their way out of the sanctum. But I do my best to protect those around me. Sometimes that is all you can do. These men and women work hard to make a life for themselves. There is solace in that, you know? You've been a captain for a while, but you had a life before this, right? I caught eels, he told him. Ah, yes, a fisher, a good life indeed. The way Mockley was shifting the conversation, as if he was almost droning on, of course made Valrin more curious of him and his words. This place was familiar to him, but he was not lying when he knew he had never been here. He wasn't even too sure where here was, and his only guess was east. They emerged from the cave, passing by two more turtle statues, to come to a large rock that overlooked the northern shore of the island. Suddenly, he saw something he had never seen. Several of the villagers were riding the waves rolling onto the coast. They had boards of some kind underneath their feet. Mackley smiled. The great god Meridas gives us gifts from under the sea and on top of it. I, for one, am a priest who loves to ride the waves. Ride the waves? Valrin asked. Like on wood or something. The term we have for it here is wave sliding. You paddle out to where the water is deep, he pointed. You lay on your stomach, swimming with your board under you. Then, he pointed again, watch. A woman was swimming toward the coast as a wave came up behind her, growing in size and starting to push her up slightly. She then pushed herself to her feet in a quick cadence, and almost quicker than Valrin could see what she was doing, she moved within a crashing wave, somehow weaving just underneath the crest of the wave. As the wave broke, she tumbled in the surf, moving quickly to get back on her board and paddle back out. It is a pastime of many in this part of the world. The origins of wave sliding are further south of here, but it spread to many islands. I'm surprised you've never seen it. Valrin had done many things in his life so far, but he had never seen anything quite like this. As Mockley led him down toward the beach, he saw Ordak and Melia running with boards of their own and jumping into the icy water. That water has to be frigid, Alara shouted, following them from the upper rocks where the village sat. This beach, though on the northern shore, was actually just down from the village itself and had many huts that faced the ocean. A larger fishing vessel was visible on this side, with even more large vessels hidden behind it. Those were not fishing vessels at all, but he didn't see anyone on those ships. It seemed while Valrin and Mockley had been speaking in the sanctum, the others had eaten and headed toward the beach. Evern and the others were coming up over the hill, and Alara stood with her arms crossed, watching as Melia and Ordak paddled out. How was the food? Valrin asked. It was good, Alara said but then the talk went to swimming and somehow wave sliding, and now these two idiots are heading out. Nevron ran by next, 
the king's typically more stoic nature gone as he threw down his robe, running completely naked toward the water with a brown board in his hand. And I'll add that to the things I wish my eyes had never seen, Aviam said. What has gotten into them? Alara said. It was the whiskey, Evern said, sipping his own small glass. That is all I can say of it. Valrin watched as Melia fell off her board repeatedly, while both Ordak and a nude Nevron seemed to have quite a knack for wave sliding. I have never seen such a thing, Valrin said. No, I guess not in the glacial seas, Evern said. It is not too uncommon, though I do think these three might be a tiny bit cold with the number of times they're falling off. It wasn't long at all until the sun began to set, and though Ordak was fine, both Melia and especially Nevron were quite cold from their shenanigans wave sliding. Kerak and several of his men led them back to the hall, and Mackley served them a warm spice drink that didn't taste quite like tea or coffee, but was good nonetheless. Tastes like cinnamon, Ordak said. Ever since I introduced you to using cinnamon, I swear it is all you talk about with drinks, Nevron said. Wait until I tell you about nutmeg. Now that is a good spice. This island has a mix of races, Evern said to Mackley. I have seen those of men, shadow elves, and high elves. Mackley just nodded. I'm surprised, Evern said. They do not have any quarrel with one another? He laughed. When you live here, there are not many chances in general. Karak here makes sure of that. We protect our island and our waters. We bring glory to Meridas, and if you threaten that, he uses you as bait. There was an odd silence in the hall until Carrick started laughing. That's a bit dark, but I like it. Mockley smiled. In truth, the people here have many stories that we do not question. You work, you fish, you serve the gods. It is simple yet complex. No dwarves? Ordak asked. Only on occasion. Sea dwarves came here once. Those we did use for bait. Carrick said as he slurped his whiskey. We're not fans of sea dwarves either, Valrin said. They took your fishing waters too? You could say that. Carrack leaned in, sipping his drink and staring at Valrin. How was he born by a storm? He looks like a normal flesh and blood person. He is normal, Carrack, Mackley said. How much have you been drinking? All of it. I figured that was your ailment. Mackley bowed to them. I retire for the night. Take care when going to Captain Morrow's vessel. The rocks are quite sharp there, and there have been young glacial sharks there. They enjoy the shallow pools. And if you see that rascal Radahala, be sure to tell him to come say hello to me at my shrine. As Mackley headed out of the hall, Carrick stared off in a drunken daze. Ordak was not too far from the same, and if Nevron was passed out or sleeping, Valrin couldn't tell. Melia and Alera had already gone to sleep in one of the side rooms of the Great Hall, and only Aviam and Evern remained with Valrin. Have either of you even seen Radahala? Valrin asked. He was crying about his sand cow the last I saw. He was quite upset but seemed hopeful, though I do believe he might have become a bit madder since arriving here. Yes. Aviam said. He is deeply troubled. If only it was so easy for the genies to act as they do in the myths, just granting wishes. We have permission to go to the lost captain's ship? Evern asked. Yes, and I found out something strange. The captain's name was Marotua. Supposedly he is from the Shadowlands or something like that. Clan Tua was a vampire clan, or at least they became one. Weren't you raised by a Tua? My Aunt Tua, Valrin said. Strange name, said Ivorn. She must have been hiding something. That she was a vampire. Still strange to use her clan name if she was hiding, though not many of the glacial seas knew of the clans of the Shadowlands, especially the smaller ones. Obviously, she is not your real aunt, so there'd be no relation to you and the lost captain, but it is a strange coincidence, to be sure. Valrin went for the black bottle with a shell on it, clearly not tea or coffee, 
but as he poured a small bit into his cup, the aroma burned his nostrils. Rum, from the islands near the north region that lies east of Taria, Evern said. Islands we haven't been to. They're interesting people, some of the best sailors of the race of men. They trade with the dwarves of Haradar and send their rum east. I recognize the bottle. He took a sip of the rum and immediately felt dizzy. He staggered toward his seat, gripping it before falling. Too soon for the rum to have done that, he heard Evern say. Valrin's eyes saw nothing but a dark storm. A woman was crying. He could see ice and rain splashing across the bow of a ship. Hold on, the man at the helm said. The ship rolled to the side, and glowing runes shot across the railings, bringing up a large sheer white wall of energy. The ship lurched to one side, flipping the vessel onto its right side. The captain made a hard turn right, flipping the mast back the opposite way as a gust of wind shot up from behind them. We must turn back, the woman cried. We can't, we can't turn back. It is too late. Aveum placed her hands on him. A spirit grips him. Her hands began to glow white, and even noticed a silver flash as something fled from him. Valrin opened his eyes. Are you okay? Evern asked. Yes, I am fine. He looked around. How did I end up on the floor? There was a spirit upon you, Aveum said. He rubbed his head, looking back to the rum. Is it tainted? Evern stood up, going to the table and smelling the rum. I do not think so. I don't think this caused what happened to you. I saw something strange, a ship in a storm, a woman crying, a man guiding a vessel that had powers like the Ayla Sunrise. They were fleeing. A vision of the fall of the Dwemhar? Aviam suggested. Perhaps it is something of the past? What spirit? Some shadow of death? Evern asked. No. In fact, it didn't feel of darkness at all. It was pure. It took our captain like he had drunk a bottle of rum, though. Aviam, we will both sleep near him. I'm not a child, Valrin said. I think it is fine. You might. I don't, Evern said. We've been through enough as of late. We're on a strange island and in strange waters. You might not think you need it, but I don't care. What Evern wanted, Evern got. Valrin lay down, knowing full well he could not sleep, and it seemed Evern and Evium thought he could or forgot he didn't sleep. He lay there in the now dark room, a crackling fire dying as the wind cut through the upper eaves of the ceiling, whistling. He could hear Evern snoring now. Avium, however, was lying as still as a corpse. When she had first lain down, he could hear her rhythmic breathing, deep breaths that she held, and then long expiratory breaths, a period of pause much longer than he could do, and she'd inhale again. He could feel her upon his mind at first, but she was asleep now. He slipped out of bed and crept across the room. He picked up the bottle of rum and continued walking toward the door. As he pushed it open and stepped outside, he took a deep breath of the ocean air. Looking up at the gargantuan rocky ceiling above him, he looked over to where they had been waves sliding earlier in the day. There were a few people on the beach with a small fire. He took a sip of the rum, partially nervous he'd wake up on the ground, but nothing happened. The rum tasted sweet to him, a refreshing drink to be sure. Much better than the red wine he had back in Taria. He walked away from the main hall to a flat area of sand in a small alcove of stone. Here he found a sitting area that looked west, toward the sea. He watched the rolling waves coming in from the greater ocean, crashing into the shallows before the island. He glanced over at the lost captain's ship. He felt sadness overtake him, and he did not understand why. Part 2 The Last Song Valrin had sat beside the sea all night. As he lay against the rock, the first glimpse of morning crept over the horizon, turning the sky purple and red. 
He was slightly dizzy as he sat up and bumped the bottle of rum, causing a good amount of it to spill on the rocks near him. He set up the bottle and sighed. There was a distinctness about this place that he just couldn't understand. He felt a drawing to just remain where he was, yet, as he had several times, he swore he saw shadows moving up the village itself. He heard a bird call in the rocks high above, but couldn't see it. Smells of rum here, Evern said, slowly walking to his side. It does smell as if one knocked the bottle over on the ground. That would be a shame. Evern pulled out his pipe before opening up a tobacco jar. New? Valren asked. No, borrowed it from Carrick. Says it is a good blend. A Viam will go with us as well as Alera. The others said they plan to wave slide. It would be good for them to relax, Valren said. My thoughts exactly, Evern said as he packed his pipe. The air had a salty smell beyond that of the ocean, and as Evern lit his pipe with his staff, the smell became more pronounced. Good, good leaf, he said, puffing. He looked over to Valrin. Your eyes are red. You've been thinking of her. I actually haven't, Valrin said. I just feel an unending sorrow. It overtakes me. That aside from the truth that I can't stop thinking about what Radahala told me. He said I do not understand my own story. That even the bit about being the Stormborn is a story. He even talked about my mother and father. Ignore that, Evern said. When we sort out what is going on, I believe I'll find myself with my staff through that genie's form. Do you think he has a beating heart, or is he just energy? Valrin laughed. Stab someone with a staff? Wouldn't be my first time doing such a task. Won't be the last time I think about it or carry it out. Ever since we started on this fiasco with Eliui, I don't think anything has been as it should have been. This Marog and his ilk are a stain upon our world. We get your ship back and stop Misla. Then maybe we can go back to the simplicity of dealing with dwarven pirates, sail the glacial seas, go back to my old island. Is that your plan? What? Go back to your island, get away from this? I don't mind. You've been through a lot. I understand. Once I'm done with Misla, I want to protect the seas, but from a home place, perhaps even travel further south, look for some good spices for Ordak. Evern took a long draw of his pipe. I'm a member of the crew, Valren. I have no desire to go back to my island and stay. Maybe in time I'll return home. Home? The Shadowlands? You'd go back? I sometimes feel I shouldn't have left, he said. In truth, I have a great deal of respect for you. You take your charge and see it through. I now make my charge to help you. I failed in my other. What was your other charge? Evern paused for a moment, holding his pipe between his lips, but not breathing. It doesn't matter, he said at last. I embraced a life of solitude to protect others, to do what was best. I took a path away from that which I was. I embraced magic. He tapped his staff. The day I pick up a blade again will be the day my life changes from this to my old path, and I think a path that will surely take me to my death. I can't imagine you with a sword, Valrin teased. I understand that, but I wasn't bad with a blade. Quite good, actually. Evern smiled. But magic, magic is something beyond blades, a practice I have much enjoyed. It takes a different part of the mind, to be sure. As I guess you're understanding now with the god's words you've been learning? It's strange. I've used the dust recently, and, well, I don't understand exactly how it works. Evern shook his head. It's easier sometimes to just trust it and not understand. I feel us mortals can't understand the realms of the arcane and spiritual as simply as, say, sailing a ship on the seas. There was a flapping sound in the wind. Valrin looked up to see Rornuk and Nura circling high above the island. Well, they were wondering when the dragons would show back up. I'll go tell them, Evern said, standing up. Valrin followed after him, seeing Aviam standing with Mackley. 
The townspeople will be quite shocked to see dragons, Mockley said to him. We have not had winged beasts flying here in some time. Though, I told Avium to tell the other two that there is a colony of juvenile dragons that gather to an island east of here, or so the mermaids have whispered. Do you have mermaids around this island? Valrin asked. Occasionally, but they come and go quickly. He leaned into Valrin's ear. Personally, I enjoy hearing the stories these fishers have. They swear they see them constantly, and they do. But I make it out that they are a bit crazy and should lay off the rum. He snickered. I do have my fun with these souls. Rornuk and Nora came into a landing, their wings battering the shoreline and sending pieces of shell and sand flying as they both landed with a thud. Nevron and Alera emerged from the hall with the disheveled Karak and several of his fellow fishers. Wow, a dragon here, and it's not trying to roast us alive. Makli! Makli! Do you see the dragon? If I did not, you'd need to be worried about my eyesight, the priest told him. But it's a dragon. I've only ever seen a few small sea monsters, the kind that grabs the bottom of your boat and you need a swift spear to detach. But this is a magnificent, massive, morbid, curiosity-inducing creature. Are you quite okay, sir? Nevron asked. I am. I've just never seen one so close. I'd give my right eye to see more. Careful, you might just lose an eye. We have islands of our creatures to the south. Have your travels never taken you that way, beyond the southern cape of the Shadowlands? No, that's a bit far west from here. In truth, I haven't left these islands for some time beyond traveling to Iclo, but even that was a rarity. Do you think that I could, you know, touch him? Well, Nora is a her, but Rornuk is a him. That'd be up to Alera. Come, his scales need scrubbing. I'll show you before I head off with the others. Alera led Karak away with Rornuk. Scales need scrubbing? Valrin asked Nevron. Nevron was red in the face and laughing. It's what we tell the children who aren't minding. But he's so infatuated with the dragon, he won't care at all. It's not something that needs to be done, then? Not at all. Nevron shook his head, smiling. But it can be quite gross. Ah, oh, the poor man. Are we going for more wave sliding? Ordak said, walking up with a board. Melia is already down there. Yes, yes, Nevron said. Unless, of course, we are needed elsewhere. Valrin shook his head. Good, good. Mackley bowed to Evan and Valrin. Good shadow elf, he said, looking at Evan. I have prayed for you to Meridas, and it was revealed to me that you are the second in command of the Aela Sunrise, the sacred ship of the Stormborn. Not an official title, but I wouldn't trust the half-orc at the helm. They all laughed. Good, good to protect the young man here. It is good he has such guidance in these dark times. I have noticed Radahala has been wandering around the ruins both above us and in the sea caves. He has? Valrin said. I haven't even seen him. He has become quiet, Evern said, not even trying to listen in on conversations, and he has no sand cow to tinker with. I will see to him, Mackley said. As a saint of a northern god, he still has duties to perform. I will speak to him. He looked to Valrin. Try to discern more about him. Elera and Aveam walked up. I think he'll be cleaning his scales until sunset. I've never seen such a man that enthralled by a dragon, Elera said. Good for him, Mockley said. He was quite the brute. He is quite a brute. But apparently he has a soft spot for dragons. It is good. Well, I will not delay you any more. Good luck with the ship. Mind your step. She is quite old. Mackley departed. Let's go, Valrin said. They began down toward the beach where the water was shifting with the changing tides and low tide was upon them. It worked out well. The path that Valrin and Mackley had taken yesterday took them close to the ship, 
but now with the tides lower, there was another path that led directly toward the ship. It was here Valrin noticed there were other stones just under the surface of the water that looked nothing like the huts or even the stones of the place Mockley had taken him yesterday. It's older, Valrin said. I noticed it too, Evern said. There are ruins here. As they drew closer to the ship of the lost captain, Valrin noticed that it was truly a massive vessel, longer than the Ayla Sunrise by more than double. It was broken down the center, a massive gaping hole, weathered more by time yet still holding together. Most of its hull was broken in two by a jagged piece of stone jutting out of the island itself. The center of the ship had a large statue of a black conch shell. They came to the edge of the pathway where broken pillars led up to a platform. Here, there were also two altars and burned-out fire basins. One basin was still standing on its right side, but the one on the left had been broken, and the entire basin and tower it sat upon were lying in the surf. They used to worship here? Evium questioned. I heard it more that sailors leaving the island would ask for blessings by offering up three eels and a drop of their own blood. That's what Carrick said, at least. That was before he started trying to flirt with Melia. Avern began casting a spell of earth magic, wrapping vines upon vines in a continued path, stretching over the broken pathway and connecting up to the platform beside the wreck of the lost captain's ship. He was the first to start crossing, but it was Rossi who led the way, leaping out of his robes and moving across the vine bridge to the other side. As they walked closer to the massive ship, Valrin was awestruck, staring with his mouth slightly agape. Alera pushed past him, startling him out of it. How did it get here? A storm? Avia asked. It must have been that or a large wave, Alera said. What are we looking for here? A parchment, a horn, and whatever else we can find, Valrin said. Evern made another pathway of vines, the ends snapping into place on the rotting wood of the frame. Valrin climbed across and onto the deck of the ship. For a moment he was dizzy again, but he did not fall like last night. The ship was split directly down the center, but the helm, though covered in shells, and what appeared to be the skeletons of eels offered in supposed good luck sacrifices, was also intact. But there was no obvious door. The rest of them made their way onto the ship. Valrin leaped the crevice in the ship's hull at the narrowest point, running along the edge of the railings to the stern, touching the wood with a hand and looking out to the sea. He felt the dizziness again. Captain, he heard. He jumped, not expecting the sudden word, turning back and seeing a flash of someone he did not know, before clearly seeing Evorn. Yes? Valrin, are you well? Evian asked. Yes. Why? He was confused. They were all staring at him. You are pale. I feel fine. I found the door, Evern said, still staring at him in concern. He pointed behind him. The storm doors were rotted into the frame, and the shells covered the doorway itself. Valrin went back over to the side they were on. There was a small bit of charred wood on the helm. Had to do it, but it worked, Evern said. Valrin put his hand on the charred wood. It's strange, he said, being here on a vessel that has such a story behind it, a ship that doesn't even seem a ship of its time. The wood is carved almost reminiscent of elven wood, a smooth surface with elegant markings. The planks we walk on, though weathered, still have a sheen that just simply should not be here. The condition of the ship, even as a wreck, is still beautiful. It does have a gaping hole, Alara said. She pointed down, and I see the ocean through these shiny planks. Valrin grinned. Okay, I get that, but overall... Rossi slapped Valrin's leg. The snake is antsy. It wants to see the inside, Evern said. Valrin pulled open the door, the hardwood with no window. The smell on the other side of the door was repulsive, to say the least. Valrin stepped in, drawing his blade as a source of light in the dark and musty quarters. 
There was a large table against a far wall and a disheveled and collapsed bed. Here, too, Valrin found the bones of several small creatures. At first he thought they were children, but they had very large hips and shoulders, much too wide for children. Dwarf bodies, Yvern said. They've been locked in here for some time. Perhaps not, Alara said, noticing a small hole leading to the rock beneath them. Valrin looked at the hole, noticing that it was still quite a bit too narrow for the dwarves. There were half-melted candles still set in their place on the wall, and vials of unbroken potions. Evern began going through the potions. Newt blood, odd to find here. Odd? Aviam asked. Newts are more common to the more southern regions. I just don't expect to find many potions like that in the average ship. How long ago did this ship sail? Did we ever get a date or a guess? Aviam said. No, we didn't, Valrin told her. I imagine it was a few hundred years at least. Perhaps we should start writing this down. Now you're making too much sense, Elara teased. She rustled through several folded parchments. I found parchment. Is there anything you're looking for, exactly? No, that I don't know. I think I'll know when I find it. He hadn't seen a horn, that was for sure. Most of the parchment was either wet or seemingly blank. He began to rummage through the desk, opening up a latch that allowed him to lift the desk. Here he found a pipe and a jar of half-finished tobacco. He held it up and shook it. That looks quite aged, Evern said. He reached out to take it. Valrin gave it to him, and Evern smiled. This is from Aerin, a city south of the Vindus Seas, a good desert tobacco. He was quite traveled then, Aviam said. Valrin continued going through the drawer, finding a brown book and, beside it, a rolled parchment that seemed different from the others. He took the parchment out, his heartbeat increasing as he unrolled it. It was a nautical chart. The Glacial Seas, a map of the Glacial Seas, and it's signed by the captain. In a blot of ink near the bottom, he read the name Marotua. I don't recognize the arrangement of the islands, though. But he has Urlas written down. That's a protected realm, Aviam said. He knew of it? Trava, Valrin said but I can say he has islands I don't think we've been to. We've been to that one, Evern pointed to Gurun Dothrak. There's a note, good chowder, next to it. I'd have to point out we didn't have the chowder. They exchanged a bit of a laugh between them. Alara leaned over. Near the middle of the map was an all-too-familiar island. Ayeklo, she said, pointing. But beyond that, the map was unfinished, or from the broken edge of the map had been lost. As Valrin smoothed out the map, he noticed an arrow and a number with a letter. There were more maps, but he shuffled around the desk. There is only one here. Maybe it is the parchments on the floor? Alara asked. But he left the other map here? I want to point out the hole in the ship and the fact we're suspended above the ocean. Valrin shrugged. She was right, of course. He picked up the book and opened it. It's a journal, a logbook. Eastern Glacial Seas. I have sailed for several moons in my pursuit of the end goal of my quest. Twice I have stopped at shrines to the gods, normally not much more than a source of supplies for my voyages, but I have been plagued by ever-worsening nightmares. The ocean gives me no calmness. I have told my goddess that I cannot complete what I seek, but ever on I am told to trust the signs of the polar lights. The long night of winter blows over these seas I know so well, yet upon this barren ship my heart is but a beating reminder of those who no longer live, those who followed me unto their deaths. Valrin flipped a few more pages. Eastern Rock Island. He torments me. I cannot deal with the nightmares. I can feel my sanity slipping, yet when I pray I feel the warmth of the gods. I feel I have failed so many times that redemption is dangled upon the masts of my ship as only a tease, that the gods just wish to push me as far as they can. I am not the warrior they make me out to be, 
yet I seek the favor of my goddess. The storms that blew me from my home left us upon a desolate island until the ship could be prepared. I have made it to Eastern Rock Island, but I did not find what I sought. I shall continue my journey. This is a strange island. Valrin flipped through a few more pages. Most of these had been torn out, but he came to another log entry. The script was much more erratic. The smooth text was more jagged. It was difficult to tell if it was just written hastily or something else. Eastern Rock Island. The waters shifted around the island and I discovered a, a secret. This is but a watchtower of the old world, a place of the Dwemhar. I found a wondrous place, but the storms have nearly drowned me. I ran aground twice attempting to flee this place. I have discovered that Wura has tricked me. I still work to repair my boat within sight of that blasted island, so my log entry remains as it is written. I will try to flee again. I must repair the ship further. Today my assistant became too weak. I have attempted to find a replacement, but I could not. But I think I may try my hand in the ruins. I'm careful what I record. The spurts are watching. They are all watching. I still believe my goddess is alive. That belief is of my own obnoxious belief in love. I should know better. He does not mean the goddess Etha. He speaks of his love, Aviam said. It seems as such. Eastern Rock Island. Meridas has shielded me. I attempted my flight. The center mast is broken. I am at anchor. But a great storm comes. I have killed the one who tormented me. I leave his body here. I have seen the lights upon the water. I have found the one I seek and know that it has all been a folly. I have forsaken those who have fallen. Alone, I attempt to return home with what I have rigged. May the lights of Wura not lead me astray, and if be it may, Meridas bless me, taking me under. This may be my final message. That's it. That's the last entry. The captain died here, a slight variation to the story told to us by Radahala. Yes, he didn't die fighting or even make note of being injured. He was killed, Elera said. I think he went mad, Valrin said. He felt like spirits were watching him and was careful what he wrote down. Valrin looked over to the dwarf bones. Was that the wizard? It could have been, or perhaps it was something else. He mentioned this island being part of a Dwemhar watchtower, Aviam said. Then there could be ruins hidden somewhere. Valrin nodded. There are caves throughout the island and you can see that the stone does not look completely natural here. Valrin glanced back down to the page, and his eyes noticed something he didn't see before. The captain had capitalized words within the text. Wait. He ran his finger from each letter. In the second to last entry, he wrote, The Black Box. You can see it in the text. He went to the last entry. Under. Immediately, Valrin felt underneath the desk and then knelt down, using his blade to give him some light. There was a black box. He pulled it free from whatever fastened it there. Upon this black stone box were the etchings of the stars and a shark. A hidden box? Evern asked. Perhaps this is the point to all of this? Valrin opened the box, lifting the lid slowly. The next step will be figuring out how to get away from this island, Alara said. I was talking to Nevron about it. He believes we are far off the eastern shores of the Shadowlands. He thinks we could fly to one of the border islands. There we might be able to secure a ship. Valrin took out a folded note, not at all of the same age as the parchments on the ship. What does it say? Evern asked. You must lose that which you came with. Whoever you are, whatever soul has been tricked, come to the caves. The priest of Meridas knows of me. He will direct you. I cannot risk you doing as he did. Long live the captain. Valrin looked up to Avern. Someone came here? When? How? Valrin looked down at the hole in the deck beneath the ship. He lay down, reaching toward the rock, but then seeing that the rock looked as if it had once been opened, but a large avalanche of shell and stone had covered the opening. So what we came for, someone took, Elera asked. As it seems, Aviam said, 
but that means we must be more careful. Someone did not trust us to find this as we needed yet. The priest knows this. Why didn't he tell us? Alara asked. He wants the captain to solve this on his own, Avern said. It is why he has only said what was needed. His focus is on this island, its people, and the oceans. If Valrin can't figure this out, he doesn't deserve the reward. Then I'll go to him, Valrin said. I'll figure out where we're to go and we'll go. This doesn't seem too difficult. Valrin packed away the captain's journal in his own pocket. As they exited the ship, the bright sun shining with a white glow through the thick clouds above them, Valrin squinted. He turned toward the platform beside the shipwreck to see, of all people, Radahala floating there. Stormborn, you have gone the way that was needed and acquired what we came here for, then. Valrin and the others exited the ship, and Valrin walked past him. He was trying to figure out how to word something to Radahala in the best way. Of course, he didn't have anything, but between the words of the captain's journal and the obvious subterfuge at work, he had to come up with something. I do not know, Valrin told him. Radahala began to float up and down directly in front of Valrin as they walked. You did not find the parchment? It should be obvious, black with green writing, written by the quill of Wura himself. Come, you must go back. The genie began to tug his shirt, and Valrin pulled back. There was nothing there, genie. I would know. There was the stench of the rotten ocean and old wood, waterlogged parchments and old trash. It's a wreck, not a treasure trove. There must be some explanation. Avium plans to meditate and use her powers to figure out where the items are. Just wait and stop trying to rush this. Valrin looked to Avium who knew very well what Valrin was doing. I do not rush this, Radahala said, but we do not have much time. Misla is upon the world. Do you not wish to stop it? Valrin stopped, pointing at the genie. You know I do. You're a poor excuse for a saint of Wura, with your incessant babbling and need to hurry. What plaques you, genie? There was silence between them for a few moments. Then the genie sighed. Nothing plaques me, for I am a saint of one of the Most High. I... He stammered. I will go to continue my prayers in solitude. I seek a sand cow to take us further, but thus far none have come. I leave this to you, Valrin, and your crew. The genie floated away in a hurry. Valrin continued leading them back to the main area of the village. Ordak was there and drinking ale, his wave-sliding board near him. Seemed to piss off the floating man. Did you find anything? He asked. Yes and no, Valrin said. How is everyone else? Good, good. They're practicing diving now into one of the coves. They say you can find crystals down there. I've yet to see one, but they're having quite a time. Apparently there are ruins here. Who would have thought? Apparently, indeed, Valrin said. He looked to Evern and Evium. I'll go talk with Makli, he told them. Try to sort out what we're needing to do now. Just keep it quiet. Keep it between us. Avium, Evern, and Alara nodded. If you're looking for the priest, he went up to the top of the island. The top? Yes, Ordak said. There is a stairwell down and around to the right of the surfing cove. I can take you there if you... No he interrupted. Do what you've been doing. Relax. I'll be back. He continued on his own. While the ambience and attitude of this island were perhaps the calmest and most relaxed he and the crew had felt in some time, the shadow of what was on him was greater than even Iaclo. In his mind, Iaclo was a quest to save Avium. His personal stake was less. But now, with Radahala skulking about like a thieving imp in a mask, just waiting for a moment to jump, he felt more than just the winds gusting up through the village upon his back. He followed the pathway down to the wave-sliding beach, and then back up a narrow stairwell with many statues of weathered starfish, some kind of whitefish and sharks. The narrow stairwell leading upward was not much more than a place to put one foot at a time, and only half his boot at that. 
he partially wondered how the old Mockley could make it up this way. As he came up to a flat area, and the road snaked back, leading further up the great wall like rock of eastern Rock Island, he noticed that someone, possibly even Mockley, had brought several small sardines and laid them on a stone beneath an effigy of no other than the great fish Meridas. The effigy was made out of sea rock, fashioned with gold that had somehow maintained its polish even in the windswept rocky wall where this small sanctuary sat. Valrin looked further up, noticing an arched bridge of rock, and for the first time on this island, grass up ahead. He continued on, moving quickly, as he could see he was up near the top. He looked one last time down to the cove, seeing the waves coming in from the east and breaking into the wave's sliding water. It looked as if several of the villagers had caught the wave itself and were riding it in. He looked back at his path ahead and found an almost flat area with green grass and the occasional yellow flower growing out from under rocks at random. Ahead, there was a large stone structure of some kind on the edge of the upper flat rock of the island. As Valoran made his way there, he couldn't help but notice the vast number of flowers near the center portion of the top of the island. It was strange, especially in the now gusting winds coming off the seas. He looked around, seeing that the storm that had been moving from the west was now rolling toward them, as it seemed, too, that Misla was not moving for the island. Dark deeds awaken, Valrin, he heard Makli say. The priest was standing behind him. Oh, I didn't see you. It happens. I was tending to the elven garden, you see. There are many rocks along the western edge. I saw you when you first came up here, but I gave you a moment. He looked over to Misla. Marok comes, yet the fury of the northern seas, the great storm, comes too. Did you find what you sought in the wreck? Valrin stared and Makli stared back, a small smile between them. I found a journal that led me to a box. A box led me to a note, and the note directed me to you. There is a cave, a place I must go. Mackley nodded. I will grant you access, you and one other. We do it at night. We do it without sight of Radahala. I tried to calm his restless spirit, but I was not able. As it is, what comes to pass is coming. We must all be prepared for what that means. So you know the true story of the lost captain? I know a few stories. I know of a few captains. Your story intersects with them, but is a greater tale for sure. We will speak further of this in time. He paused. Or not. You may know it better than me before long. He laughed. I must tend to my elven garden. It's been watched over by the priest of Meridas since this was a lock to the old ocean back in the time of the Dwemhar. A great wall this island once was, but you'd never guess it now. Mockley said nothing else and began toward the garden. Valrin looked back at the stone structure, noticing it was almost like a massive stone chair. A few moments later, both Rornuk and Nura roared, flying down onto the top of the island, much to the happiness of Mockley. The priest clapped as the dragons lowered their heads to him, and he pat each of them. Valrin smiled. This island really isn't too bad. Part three, cave dwelling. Valrin returned to the others below. Though Alara seemed to want to ask of what had happened, Avium broke into the conversation. Perhaps with so many around, we should just not speak of it. Besides, Evern, he... She smiled. Just look. She pointed down toward the beach, and Valrin saw the back of a man with more tattoos than Valrin had ever seen. At first he thought about it, recognizing this elf, but he did not want to believe it. It didn't seem to line up with the preconceived thought he'd had of the potion-making Shadow Elf. While, of course, it was no other than Evern of the Shadowlands, the older Shadow Elf was holding a wave-sliding board under his right arm. Down at his feet, Rossi slithered into the surf and back out. Wait, what? Valrin asked. He hurried over to Evern. What? Evern said, looking at him with a glare. You don't think I'm capable? I've been wave-sliding, as these people call it, for a dozen of your lifetimes at least. 
How old are you again? Seventeen, he said, I think. We went back in time and whatnot and likely messed something up. Who really knows? Well, Evern said, not me. But back home, we call this surfing. I don't know why these backward people of this island had to name it something so strange, but it's called surfing. The waves off Mandurel are larger than this, and there are more rocks there, but I haven't been on a board in such a long time. Perhaps I need a good refresher? At about that time, Ordak came tumbling off a wave, crashing into the surf nearby. His board tumbled in the waves in front of him, and he stood up, brushing off a few strands of seaweed. Might as well paddle out, Evern said. You up for it, Captain? I can't do this, Valrin said. I'll split my head in the shallows. Sure you can. Get aboard, take off your shirt, and get out there. I'll be waiting, and I'll show you the basics. He almost felt wrong doing this. Taking the time to do something other than the exact things he felt he should be doing was wrong. He took note of Evern's tattoos as the shadow elf waded out. He had a large blade down the center of his spine thrust into the body of a spider at about the middle of his back. Along the sides of that, he had runes of a script Valrin had never seen, along with more cruel scars than he'd expected. For a wizard, especially. Elera and Melia, the latter running up wearing a thick coat, watched as Valrin undressed down to his trousers. Oh? Melia asked. Do you know that water is frigid? I've been in it enough. I'd know. Spent some time in the spring diving into ruins and did a bit more wave sliding. Have you ever done it? Yeah, sure, right now, he said. Viam grinned and Melia laughed. One of the villagers brought him aboard and bowed slightly to him as he began toward the water. As he stepped into the surf, the water rushing over his ankles and the sand squishing in between his toes was more like ice and snow. It was frigid, and Milia was not at all joking of that fact. He shivered but began to wade out. Shouldn't we learn something on the beach like how to get on the board? He shouted out. Sure, Evern said paddling faster out toward deeper waters. Valrin pulled himself on top of the board, balancing himself on the slender wood. The surface was rough on his bare skin, likely useful for his feet, but it pinched his skin. A wave came rolling in, and he went up and down, the front of his board rising just like if he was on the Ayla sunrise before sending him back down the other side. He began to paddle, alternating left and right with his hands, moving along the surface. The waves were getting larger this way. He could see Evern and several others sitting on their boards. Ordak was there to the right, and Karak was to the left. Come now, Stormborn, Evern shouted. It isn't too bad out here. There's barely a current. Barely a current? I can feel the tug on my hands wanting to send me to the right. What's this shadow elf talking about? Another wave came over him, nearly knocking him off his board, but he kept a tight grip, pulling the dark wood close to him. The water calmed before him. Come on, you've got a few moments before the waves start really coming in. Paddle here. Avern pointed in his general area, and Valrin hurried that way. As he reached the others, he carefully positioned himself up, balancing in the middle of the board. There, not too bad, Evern said. It's pulling my skin, the board, I mean. Carrick laughed as he lay back. That's from the coral we use to roughen up the surface. You have to have that, or you'd slip right off. Carrick, now lying back on his board, stared up at the sky. Ordak was looking out to the ocean. So the biggest keys come from the water itself. You want to watch the way the waves come in the rhythm of the ocean's churning. Just before the wave starts to break, you want to paddle hard to move in with it, keeping the front of your board up. You'll feel the water surging around you, pulling you faster until just like the Ayla sunrise moving atop a wave, you'll feel it. Then, it's a quick three count. One, you go to your knees. Two, you bring your right foot up. And three, you stand up, finding that balance point. 
balance point. Always a struggle for this orc. Struggle? Evern asked. I once fished you off the northern point of the Shadowlands. We were looking for moon crystal. Evern paused, laughing mid-sentence. And this fool of an orc decided he would try surfing off the great waves. Ordak buried his face. We do not need the details. We should spare them. Ripped his clothes straight off. He went flying off the wave and his board shattered against the rocks as we see orc parts flopping in the wind. It was quite a sight of amusement. Evern continued laughing as Karak sat up. The water moves beneath us. The waves are coming. Now closer to Evern, Valrin noticed the intricacies of his tattoos. What do the blade and spider mean on your back? Celebratory markings for the killing of a spider queen back in Mandorel. There is a region beneath the Shadowlands where all vile types of creatures reside. There was a certain queen that was giving us issues. I slew it. Spider queen? Like a big spider? Karak asked. No, Ordak said. But they have big spiders. He shook his head. Big spiders. They are spiders with a face like you or me, Evern said. They carry our kind away, stashing them in their subterranean lairs until they are ready to feast. Vile creatures commanding hundreds and sometimes thousands of lesser spiders. Killing one of them is considered an act of honor, particularly when you do it alone. You were alone? Carrick asked. Yes. Tough job for a wizard, but I guess you roasted it. Back then, I didn't use magic. I was alone with just my blade. Back then, that was all I needed. The water shifted beneath Valrin's feet. This was an obvious change. He looked behind him and noticed the waves beginning to roll in. Paddle, Evern said, turning on his board and moving deeper out. Time to see if the Stormborn has a knack for this. The waves were breaking to their right. Ordak, show him the way. Go! Valrin watched as Ordak paddled faster, pushing the front of his board directly into the wave and vanishing for a moment before a second wave came rolling up under the surface of the water. Ordak pushed himself up in a quick several-step motion that looked more fluid than Valrin had ever seen the orc move. Ordak vanished into the curl of the wave. Karak was next, doing most of the same that Ordak did, vanishing a few moments later. You can do it, Evern said with a wink. The winds were kicking up around them, but Evern seemed undisturbed by it. Valrin gripped his board, paddling along the next few waves. Remember, feel the current. You were born in a storm and rode the waves into Trava as a baby. This should be just like going home. Valrin nervously laughed at the irony, but nodded. Here comes one. Paddle with it, feel the ocean, push yourself up, balance, then enjoy it. Evern said. Valrin took in a deep breath, feeling the water sucking around him, the current pulling him out. He lay down, paddling hard to get on top of the wave. The water rolled underneath him, and he pushed up, steadying himself on one foot and then putting weight on his other. He began to feel the winds curl around him and the roar of the wave as it rolled over him. Suddenly, he felt a jolt beneath his board. He wavered for a moment, then fell backward, the water rolling over him as he plunged into the depths, feeling around him and pushing off the hard rocks of the island reefs. He had been plunged underneath the water, and though he wasn't hurt, something drew him down, drew him to remain where he was for a moment. It was then, looking from beneath the surface, he saw a glimmer in the rock, a glowing crystal ahead in the base of the island. He was out of air. He paddled up, kicking to the surface. As he emerged, several others were in the water. Karak and Ordak paddled toward him. Ordak grabbed his arm and pulled him onto the board. You were doing great, then you flew off. I was worried you cracked your head on the rock. No, just barely missed it, though, Valrin said. Where's Evorn? But at that moment, that very question was answered. Evorn came not on a wave, but flying upward just as a wave broke. 
Rossi was on the front of his board, and the snake's mouth was open as they moved over the water. Evern landed directly on another crest, moving underneath it and out of sight as he passed them, and the edges of the wave passed underneath them. He's still quite the rider, Ordak said. Come, your board is already nearly to the shore. Let's get you there. As Ordak paddled him to shore, he thought of the crystal beneath. While he knew of the diving spot Milia had mentioned, he was surprised that he saw one of the crystals glowing. He understood this place to be a Dwemhar ruin, though normally crystals in Dwemhar ruins did not glow unless activated. He'd speak to Makli about it. But as they came to shore, he saw Evern happier than he had ever seen the Shadow Elf. That felt better than a million spiders roasting under a spell of burning flame at midnight. I'm not sure of your reference, Nevron said, holding an ale, but we'll trust that it's good. Evern ran up to Valrin. Did you enjoy it? Was it good? Valrin laughed. It was until I fell. Evern smacked him on the back. Falling is part of it. Whoa. Now it's time for some warm tea and for Rossi to have something to eat. They gave their boards to the other villagers who were smiling. These people have never seen such antics, Carrick told Valrin. You and your crew bring quite the life to the island. Returning to the main hall where drinks were shared in abundance, as yet another ship was coming into the docks behind the island, Evern and Valrin sat with Carrack. Did you by chance check into what I asked? Evern asked Carrack. I did, and I did. I sent your message to Taria as you asked. Quite a far journey, but your letter will get there. The Owls of Okar are known to be the strongest flyers in the lands. They will return the message here if possible but I do not know how long you intend to stay. I don't know for sure. I was thinking about something, Valrin said. What? Evern asked. You killed spiders in the Shadowlands, yet when we were searching for the remedy for Edanos, you mentioned how glorious Viarika was. Is she now basically a spider queen as you described? An astute observation, Evern said. She is, but she is of the ones who were greater, before they were twisted beneath Mandarel. You see, the dark places beneath the old city are connected to a vein of ancient magic. Back in the times of void demons that the Dwemhar fought, some hid in the deep places of the world. Most queens had been twisted. It is what began our crusade to kill so many of them. Now, Mandarel has seals and massive doors that keep the spiders at bay, and at last I knew they had ceased their attempts against the actual city. We secured peace. Mandarel, Karak said. A place I know. They have good tea there. No doubt you mean the green tea, Evern said, smiling. Yes, it is quite good. We have to grind it down into a very fine powder, but especially with a bit of honey, it is quite good. There was a sudden commotion, and several barrels of ale went rolling off a cart. Karak jumped up to seemingly go yell at his men leaving Averne and Valrin. Hey, I saw something, Valrin said. Something under the water that I did not expect. Averne sipped his ale, a bit of foam forming on his upper lip that he licked away. You speak of what I have noticed. You saw it? No, but this place is Dwemhar. The rocks beneath your feet are not the same that formed over this wall as it once was. I have seen rock like this before. I noticed it the other day, but I'll point it out to you. Look at the layering, he said, pointing to where the village rose above the rest of the island. There were layers here, like mud stacked upon mud, allowed to roll to a certain point, and then left. Fire destroyed this place. Perhaps it was a border wall to an old city beneath the ocean, but it was not water that covered this place, but fire. So. Before the flood? I guess it is so. But the wall remained. The target was where the village is. A good portion of whatever was attacked must have been melted. Destroyed, then? Well, melting normally does that. But that's the key, Valrin said. I saw a glowing crystal in the submerged ruins. This place may have been destroyed, but something has activated it. What are you thinking? 
I don't know, Valrin whispered. I know that Mockley has allowed us to enter the caves, but advises us to wait for night. We must be wary of Radahala. You're not exactly reading minds to figure that out, though. True. They sat silently for a bit longer, and soon Karak returned with the Viam. The others are planning to roast fish, she told them. They plan to have a ceremony honoring Meridas, and then make offerings to the lost captain. We are welcome to watch. Makli will be leading it, as the villagers have said. Quite an honor to see this, Karak said. I think you'll enjoy it. Evern finished his drink, and Valrin nodded. We would. Thank you, Karak. Dusk was upon them. Valrin and the rest of the crew assembled on the beach, where they had been wave-sliding before. A large fire burned on the beach. Villagers had assembled with wooden flutes and drums. The drummers played a rhythmic beat, loud and forceful. The flutes whistled like the screeching wind. Mockley and several townspeople covered in red paint emerged from a passage in the rocks. Mockley was adorned with a crown of reef, holding a large dagger with a blue jewel in the hilt. As they slowly made their way down to the beach, they entered the water just to their knees. One of the attendants wearing paint used a casting net and caught several small fish. Walking back to the shore, he emptied the net, tossing back the smaller fish and picking up the largest one. He kissed it before handing it squirming to Makli. Those in paint knelt, and Makli spoke. By the glory of our god, Meridas of the seas, with this sacred dagger of the saints of Meridas, I sacrifice this fish. May its blood call forth the ones who bring glory to Meridas. He stabbed the fish. Blood poured from the corpse. He went to each of the ones wearing red paint, dribbling them in blood, before tossing the carcass of the fish into the fire and bowing. Thank you for your sacrifice. He kissed his blade, licking the blood before then tapping with the edge of the dagger, each of those painted. Go forth. Call those that hide in the depths. Call them forth. Those he had doused in blood took to the water, swimming with great speed into the surf. This is the oddest of ceremonies. Avium whispered, and that dagger, that dagger I've read about. There were conflicting reports if they had one or many of those daggers, but the description matches. So it's a sacred dagger? Valrin asked. Well, yes, but no, that's not its most important quality. You could control water with that, call it forth or push it away. It is a legend or so I believed it. Makli stood with his arms outstretched. Valrin began to see lights moving in the water, something glowing. He reached for his sword, as did Elera and Melia, but those of the island did not seem disturbed or like they had seen something they did not expect. Several of those who swam out hurried out of the water as more of the lights entered the shallow waters of the cove. When at last all the swimmers had returned, Mockley lifted his staff, sending a bright flash into the sky. Meridias has blessed us. At that moment, a massive creature exploded out of the water, a glacial white shark with runes upon its body. It fell back into the water, and several others breached. Storm born of the glacial seas, Makli cried out. Valrin looked at his crew, but Makli yelled again, Storm born, come! As Valrin approached, the gathering of villagers parting as he walked through them, he noticed that the sharks continued to patrol in the waters a bit deeper out. He waded out to where Mockley was as something broke the surface. It was a massive whale with a large horn, or more so, a tooth that looked like a horn. It was a narwhale. You know these creatures? Mockley asked. I do. I have seen them before. This one is one of a great pod a narwhal Meridas has spoken to me of. This is Tula Ciro, a young and slightly arrogant one, I hear. The narwhal shook its head and spat water. Makli laughed. But he is a unique creature, one tied in fate to that of the Stormborn and the future. There are many pirates in the world, and it seems that in your absence the seas bleed red where you're from. 
These creatures, among others, seek your protection. Valrin hesitated before turning to Mackley. I haven't been there in some time. One event led to another, and I just couldn't get back. Mackley stopped him. No, you are not here to be judged. These creatures are faithful to Meridas and to the purpose of the Stormborn. No matter what, they are beside you. They come to you from the depths to honor you as we honor Meridas. The glacial sharks and the narwhals are here to protect these waters from otherwise vile creatures. He leaned into Valrin's ear. Misla comes. You have little time. The monsters beneath the floating behemoth threaten that which we hold dear. I will end the ceremony, and then you will go with one other to the caves. He stood up straight, lifting his hands. May glory be to Meridas, who guides our path and fills our nets. Bring the fish. It is time to cook. Mackley looked down at him as the rest of the village began to move at once, bringing buckets of fish to the large fire. We head toward a precarious time, he said to him. The part of this place that was Dwemhar. I believe beneath these waters, the ruins are active, that someone or something must be there. Mackley just nodded. I wish to evacuate the island, perhaps soon. But I have only spoken to Carrick about this. I hope our enemy will reveal themselves when we are in position together. Our enemies seek to destroy both of us, I fear. Misla comes, Marog comes, but Makli and Valrin stand ready to meet them. He smiled, and Valrin nodded. I will take Evern with me into the caves. Very good, Makli said. They exited the water, making their way around the large fire. The villagers were taking the fish and skewering them with massive poles before laying them to roast by the fire. Though most of the crew were helping with the fish, or, in Ordak's case, trying to play the drums to the rhythm that the drummers were drumming, Evurn was waiting up on the rocks from the beach. Makli signaled for Karak. I take them to the hall to speak in private. I will return. Karak nodded, making a point to shout and get the attention on himself. Praise be to Meridas, who calms the sea and allows us the liberations we have. It was a distraction and it was working. As those closest to him began to tap kegs and cheer, Mackley led Valrin and Evern away. These festivities are quite boisterous, Evern said. All a distraction. Karak keeps his crew within the island on my order. As I told your captain, we head toward a precarious time, and I must make every choice with the goodwill of all of them, and you and my god in full mind. He led them to yet another place hidden within the island. They took a path up near where he had taken Valrin when visiting the sanctum. Considering they were headed to something known as the caves, he suspected to go down. But Mockley took them up, directly along a narrow path that hugged the interior wall of the island. They followed a pathway that went into the rock itself through a rather dark passage that opened up to a precarious cliff pathway above the water. This was a spot north of the wave-sliding cove. Here there'd be no chance to swim or wave-slide. The water crashed up against the rock, sending sprays of ocean water upward. Here they walked around the edge of the precarious cove, coming to a walkway that went out over the water and to a small island off the main island. Valrin noticed more of the statues to Meridas here. Small stone sharks guarded the doorway hidden behind dried seaweed. This place is made to look like a sanctum. The villagers do not go here. I have protected this place and open it to you now, at what I fear is the end. There was a small torch to the side of the dried seaweed. Mockley took the torch and lit the seaweed, revealing a cavernous path that went deep down into the rock. This is it? Valrin asked. This is one of many caves. But this is the one you seek. I take my leave. Return to me when you're done. Reveal to me the next path, for beyond this, I do not know. Mackley left rather quickly, causing Evern to stare at him as he walked away. That one is acting strange, Evern said. I trust him, but he's just odd. Surely there is no living person here? Living, 
dead, spirit, undead. Of the four, I highly suspect it is not the first one. Evern laughed. That would be too easy. Would it, though? With us? When is it ever easy? Evern laughed. True, my friend. Evern ignited his staff, providing light as they entered the passage. There was a narrow stairwell carved out of the sea rock that was about as well made as Valrin expected in what was otherwise a seemingly hastily built hut of rock and sticks. Evern led the way, ducking as they got further down, and then finding a chamber of sorts with a small window looking out to the sea. Quite interesting, Evorn said. Yes, it looks like they built this to connect to the even older passage here. Valrin pointed to the wood affixed to the much more ancient stone of the rock, leading deeper down. I didn't notice that particular fact, but yes, I see that. I was more interested in calling this a cave when it clearly is a passageway. Valrin drew his sword, moving ahead, the white fire on his blade lighting his own path ahead of Evern. It'll be a cave or a mansion, he paused, looking back at Evern or another portal to the past. You like pointing out our knack for strange places and times, don't you? I do. I found it better to embrace the strange happenings. They're going to keep happening. We might as well be ready for it. As Valrin and Evern made their way down another flight of stairs, they came to a passage that led, much to their actual surprise, to what appeared to be a cave entrance in the rock. It was about double Valrin's height, and had glowing mushrooms coming out of the ground. Not a portal, Valrin said. It is a cave. They went into it, finding the smell to be that of salt and stagnant water. It was a cave all right, and even had a stream of water trickling in from a crack of rocks high above them. Valrin could hear the distinct clicking of an unseen crab in the darkness. One who enters this place knows not which path they are upon. The voice was raspy and sudden, speaking as if all around them yet focused toward them. We are sent by the grace of Makli. We seek the one who was upon the ship of the lost captain. That's what they're calling her now? Our great vessel is not even remembered by name. Our captain considered lost. What travesty is this when the sea no longer holds the record of our song? When a battered wreck is but the only remembrance of what we were? Surely you are the storm-born whispered in the spirit realm? The one who a time ago called upon the forces of the Dwemhar fleet of old? I am Valrin of Trava, storm-born of the glacial seas. Yep. Yet you come here to an island on the edge of the world? An island cursed by a vengeful spirit? Yes, yes, that is what resides here. I saw our good captain, Valrin. I was there. I saw him upon his final moments, driven crazy in the madness that was Wura. The god's power lashed out in a vengeful show of force beyond that required. Yes, my good captain managed to strike down the wizard, but that wizard led many captains away, gathering their souls. It is a curse of the captains, and he was left here when his captain was drawn to this island. I wait forever for my own captain. My body has been broken, as the spirit that haunts this place has broken me. I have reached out to Meridas, and I have been provided a place to safely wait, for the gods must not act beyond their supposed reach. I never cared much for the gods. I care less for them now, but I must give some degree of respect for whatever it means in the end. The room began to glow with a greenish hue. Both Valrin and Evern lifted their weapons. A specter appeared, half a man. His legs were torn off, the flesh of his abdomen dangling in a gaseous form. See me as I am, as I was made. When the fury of the gods swept over this island, our ship was thrown into the rocks. I pushed our captain aside and was torn apart by the force that broke our ship. He carried me to the looking chair high above the island. There, in solace, I waited for him to return. But I saw instead lightning and fire, heard the clang of sword and spear. When at last the storm silenced, my captain returned to me broken and within death's grasp. He embraced me and then was taken by the priest who guarded this island, offered to the sea. It was then I reached out to Meridas, seeking assistance further. 
My resting place is where I died. There you shall find what you need. But more will be needed than that. You seek that which made our captain great, the items he spent a lifetime gathering. Oh, what he did for his love to be betrayed as he was. It was never her fault, but the gods claimed it so. Ignoring the spirit they allowed to remain in the living realm. A true lover's tragedy. The story we heard said she betrayed him, sought the wizard to destroy him when he attempted to return home. The ghost solidified for a moment, pointing at Valrin. She would never. The spirit lies still. It tells stories. I'm the first mate of Captain Morrow. I know what happened. She had sought his return, dealing in the magic of the West, from the deserts. She wished upon that which some call a djinn, but as the story goes, she did not get exactly what she sought. She wanted the return of her lover, and instead the djinn gave her a specter, a captain, yes, but not her love. She had sought to throw herself from the cliffs, feeling she had betrayed him, and at that moment she saw the crystal that sat upon our bow on the horizon. I was there when the captain saw her upon the cliffs. This is why I await you in such a place. I know I am but a spirit, but this will allow you to see what you need to see. The room began to glow. Several crystals spun in the darkness as a hum filled the air. Before them, in between them and the spirit, rose a stone slab from the ground. The spirit moved into the slab, and an image appeared before them. Valrin saw as if they were aboard the ship. It was like they were there. It was dusk, and they moved toward high cliffs, and a village nestled in a cove. If he hadn't ever been to Taria, he might expect this to be what Taria looked like in description alone. But it was not Taria. They were seeing through the eyes of the spirit, or so it seemed. Captain Morrow, there is fire upon the cliffs. The first mate pointed, and Valrin could see what appeared as dancing flames. They looked at the helm, and a figure in black and silver held the wheel. A tall man with a beard that went down to his stomach. The wizard has beat us here. All hands, engage defense positions. Prepare the ward shields. The crew ran about, picking up large shields that glowed with a red, shimmering light. Captain, do we have not the energy to engage other weapons? No, our delay in the glacial seas has cost us dearly. Radgala, you said the wizard was locked away. And so he was, Captain. He has escaped. I saw we needed to go east, but you didn't listen. The captain drew his blade, pointing at the one called Radgala. You're a trickster. Against my judgment, I picked you up on that tiny sliver of rock, and now my crew has had travesty after travesty. What say you now? The wizard is here, yet you said the power of your god was strong. Incoming! A crew member shouted. Burning rocks flew down out of the sky like meteors, striking the waters around them and the ward shields. The devices the crew used deflected most of the magic. The first mate ran for the helm as Captain Morrow ran toward the front of the ship. As the first mate held the wheel, the sea surged around them, spinning the ship away from land, pushing it back. Darum, Engage static lines! Hold us in place! The first mate, who now Valrin knew was Darum, reached beneath the helm for a lever with a crystal tip. Was this a realm ship? Lines shot out from the bases of the ship, striking the cliffs ahead of them. Morrow stood upon the very front of the ship. He brought a horn to his lips, blowing several large blasts. Whales of all sizes appeared beside them as he jumped from the ship, riding one of the whales toward the cliffside. Another volley of magic rained down upon the vessel, and several struck near Daram. You are the first mate! Radgala shouted from afar. The captain has abandoned us. We must leave. It was at this moment, as the trickster ran up to the helm, that Valrin noticed a peculiar fact. This man had the same face as the genie Radahala, and though it was simply a vision, Valrin felt that the genie himself was looking at him, as this Radk Allah stared at the first mate. I will not leave my captain, you devil. 
throw yourself from the ship. I cannot, for the sea would spit me back out. The gods decree my path. I simply follow it. A storm blew upon them, black clouds rolling over them, then a scream like none other. The crew shouted, pointing. Darum looked ahead as the love of the captain fell from the high cliffs, striking the rocks and ocean beneath her. Then lightning struck the cliffs. Maro was upon the cliffs and dueled his foe. Repeated strikes fell from the heavens, striking the dark stone ahead. This wasn't lightning. This was Hakenrak. Several more blasts followed and a great white spirit rose upon the cliffs. The sky turned darker. The gusts grew around the ancient sailing ship. Valrin saw Maro again, running along the lines that the ship had launched into the cliffs. In his arms was a woman, lifeless and pale. Maro leaped aboard the vessel and several crew members came to him. He leached her spirit, sucked it from her body. Darum looked upon the woman in flowing white raiment, her hair a golden yellow, and upon her chest was a silver and blue amulet. Where's the wizard? Darum asked. I struck him, broke his body. He remains, a demon of the gods. He inhabits yet another. His power is separated from his body. I used Hakenrock to break him, and then Hadradala to purge him. It will not last long. We sail for Eastern Rock Island. It is our only chance. It is the nearest sacred place. He holds her spirit. We must purge the wizard from her body so that her spirit can return and both of them are ensured safe. You think this is the one you've been chasing? The one who vowed to end your line? I know it, Maro said. At that moment, a vessel moved out of the cove. It was a ship with great green sails and was moving quickly. The sea surged around them and blew upon them with a deafening wail. The static lines holding the ship burst, throwing the vessels asunder. Darum was thrown from the helm, and it was then Radk Allah took to the wheel. A moment later, the vessel with green sails was upon them. Darum pushed himself up and went for a nearby spear as spells struck the deck of the ship, throwing many of the crew members off. Hooded figures with pointed hats jumped upon the ship, striking Maro with spell after spell. Darum threw his spear, but was thrown against the deck with a blast of spinning ice. He couldn't move. The captain was stabbed in the stomach, and the last Darum saw, his love was carried to the ship with green sails. Darum began trying to crawl, seeing the ship with green sails departing. Captain Morrow was crawling for the helm, bleeding profusely. Darum pushed himself up, seeing very few crew members left alive. He betrayed us, Morrow shouted. He betrayed us. Valrin and Avern suddenly saw darkness and then flashes of images. They saw Eastern Rock Island and then Captain Morrow standing alone aboard his ship as the waters tossed him. The woman from before lay bleeding at his feet as he fought the wizard. Then they continued to see from Darum's eyes, sitting atop the highest point of the island, looking down. He was fading from life his body truly broken. There were spirits of many standing around him. Betrayed, lost, taken, broken. The voices spoke to Darum and then blackness to his eyes. Valrin looked at Evern, who was deep in thought, staring at the stone before them. The spirit returned in his specter form. A different story than you have been told, no doubt. Yet you knew one, did you not? Radahala. He is as your Radk Allah. He is here? Valrin nodded. The genie works with the jinn, a messenger of sorts, drawing those of power towards sacred places so that demons may possess them. A jinn is a natural form demon of old, not of the power that the Itsu have, but strong. Our captain knew this, but he believed she'd be safe. The place she was kept was a sanctum of Meridas, a cove of protection, but she was distressed. She had the gift of foresight of the Dwemhar, though those of the Strontavedi were meant to be broken of the old powers. I have never heard of the Strontavedi. They were the Dwemhar who were cut off, left to die when the floods came. 
Maro with Dwemhar? Darum laughed. Good thing our captain is resting eternally, or you'd anger him with that one. To the Stranta Vedi, to be called that was a curse. So you tell us that Radahala is the same as this Radk Alla, Evern said. We knew we could not trust that nervous wreck of a genie. He has been erratic at best. You tell us a story that differs from the one he told, but the end is the same. Everyone died. Not all, but most, Darum said. I tell you it will take the blood of the Stormborn to unlock that which is kept atop this island. Only then will it all begin to make sense. I am proud to have awaited the coming of you, Valrin of Trava. The Stranta Vedi still protect these waters even after the fall of so many captains. The line of proud captains, like that of Maro, has continued, though I know that the wizard Maro fought entirely meant to destroy his lineage. And the spirit? Valrin asked. The one that haunts this place still. Mockley keeps the power contained, but you never said if Maro destroyed the wizard. Maro broke every living body on the island, killing all the spirit could take. The priest of Meridas, who was present, sought to preserve the body of his love, but it was only to last for a time. Their hope was that it would be long enough to preserve the sacred line of the Strantavedi. Maro sought to buy more, though he was already mortally struck. I have served my purpose in this as I have told you the next step. Nothing of our old ship is as it seems. You will discover it soon. In a flash of light, the room then became dark. I have never heard such a story of the Stranta Vedi. Those are the sea people. Valrin crossed his arms. We cannot trust Radahala at all. We have been played in some strange game, not unlike that of Maro. We don't know the details of this game. We don't need to. We cannot allow him to push us one way or another. We go to the top of this island, to where Durham told us to go. That is our next step. Part 4. Evern's Choice Valrin and Evern departed the ruins with haste, making their way back out and finding of all people, Mackley waiting for them. Now you have seen the story as it is, not as you were told. We need to get to the top of the island. The next step lies there. Mockley nodded. Yes, that is the next place. He embraced Valrin. You were always meant to come here at some point, but certain events were not a part of this. His eyes traced behind Valrin. He turned to look and saw that Misla had drawn even closer. Your time is short, Mockley said. I wish it wasn't. There is much more I could tell you, but it does not matter. I know not what will come in the coming hours, but I gift you this. He handed him a wave-sliding board. It isn't much, but it is one of my own. I want you to have something of this island. My order has not protected this place for so long just because of devotion to Meridas. But this... This is a gift. Valrin took the board from Mockley. It had black markings made out like a shark. The wood itself was a dark red color. There was a small black rope lopped through and secured to the board, with a silver clasp allowing Valrin to sling it onto his back. He did so, and Mackley bowed. One more thing. He gave him a small scroll. You want to know your history. I know some. Do not worry about this now, for you cannot even read it. You are to keep it. He laughed. Do not fear. It cannot be destroyed by water or fire. It is a testament to the old ways and the first sailors upon these waters. Valrin took the scroll. It was sealed with black wax. Thank you, Valrin said, for both. Now go, up to the top. I prepare within the island. We are ready to fight alongside you, Valrin. Misla comes. Valrin nodded, and he and Evern continued on. Though Misla was blowing in a warm air now, the storms to the west grew in intensity, lightning reaching out like feelers, nearly striking the island but still just offshore. They ascended to the top of the island, making their way past the elven garden and to the ruins Valrin had seen before. Looking up, he saw that the stars were slowly being blotted out by the clouds, but in the spots that were still open, 
there were hundreds shining down. I cannot help but imagine this land before it was flooded. This must have been a high point, and the seas to the west were like a valley that went on as far as we could see, Evern said. But Valrin's focus was completely on the ruins now. He led Evern around the edge of several broken rocks, finding a stone stairwell and a great throne. Here, too, was a silver staff, covered in vines and overgrown with flowers. Valrin went to the throne and found but a few bones scattered about. There was a spearhead on the ground. He picked it up, and his mind thought back to the vision Darum had shown them. This was the same spear he had seen then. This is him, Valrin said. He went to walk around the chair when he stumbled, dropping the spear point and cutting his own hand. His blood fell upon the throne, and the throne glowed for a moment. There was a spark and a flash. The silver staff glowed and then went dark. He looked out for a moment and saw something he did not before. Looking from the throne and past the silver staff, he saw the dark stone of a lone tower. He knew he hadn't seen that before. He stood up, moving away from the chair, and his eyes widened as the tower vanished. Evorn! He tapped him. Look! Evorn saw the same. A veiling spell? Or something else? Valrin rubbed his finger. My blood. It did this. Just as Darum had said. He nodded. Come on, this way. They stayed within what would have been the shadow of the staff. Several times, Valrin moved away from the path to see the tower vanish, but then returned the moment he returned to the straight line between the chair, the staff, and the tower. As they came to the tower, Valrin was surprised as to how small it was. This was not a great tower like the way stations they had seen before. It was small, no taller than the center mast of the Aela Sunrise. A narrow entrance and an even narrower spiral staircase greeted them as they entered. Valrin went up, making his way to the top that barely had room for Evern and Valrin to stand beside one another. Here, there was a dish and fine dust lying in a pile within it. Valrin touched the air above them, and it sizzled. A ward, Evern said. It shrouds this place and protects it. And what of this dust? I hate to be obvious like this, Captain, but perhaps you want to follow what the parchment here says. Valrin looked over to see what Evern was talking about seeing, as there wasn't much room to hide anything. Just behind them on a stone ledge was a broken inkwell, a feather, and a parchment. The spilled ink had damaged most of the parchment. Valrin picked it up, attempting to read what was basically scribbles. I do not know this script. Avorn took it. It isn't a script I know either. It doesn't even look like words. Valrin took it back, attempting to decipher what it was they were seeing, when a bit of his blood was absorbed by the parchment. The script shifted and became the common tongue he knew. Wait, I can read it now. My blood did something, and it became readable. This is written with my last breaths. I don't know how to explain what has transpired. A storm churns over us. I have life, but for a time. We, the Strantavedi, have all but been destroyed. You who read this are the last, no doubt. I do not know if even you will read this, but in my heart I believe there is a chance. I trust Meridas. I curse myself for not having faith. I should have kept true to the gods. Though Wura is a trickster, and his saint has proven misleading, it is all because of a greater evil. The dust of the fallen star is but the last of its kind. Our most sacred vessel fell from the skies and allowed us to build all we did to prepare for the end. Now, I leave it here under protection. If you have found it, it is meant to be yours. I know I will never know you, but if it is true, if we are the last, I know who you are. It was only our blood that could unlock this path, a sealed place ordained by Meridas himself, and ensured by the winds of Dimmon. If by luck and chance and swindling has allowed you to reach this point, then truly the Strantavedi live on elsewhere, and you may not need what is provided. But if fate has brought you to this tiny island, and nothing has gone right, know that you are on the path of your blood and your family. 
Release this dust to the winds of dim. Your fate is tied to it. Go where it says, and your greater path will be revealed. Beware that which is on this island. Without the guidance of the gods, I do not know if you may defeat it. The storm is getting worse, and my pain is as well. I must try to wait, to see you. It is hard to hold on. I do wish to tell you a greater secret. The note ended. Beneath this was the ink blot from the broken ink vial. Valrin set the note down and leaned against the shelf. He stared for a moment, looking at Evern, who was leaning on his staff. Rossi had curled up to the tip of the staff and was slowly reaching with his serpent body to the nearby wall. Evern grabbed him and tucked the snake back away. Keep your mind here, Evern told him. Evern, I can't avoid thinking about this. I can't avoid thinking that I am of the Strontavedi, that the reason Maro fought to get his love to this island is that... He paused. She was pregnant. Evorn sighed. You think you... I know. This island is not a place we happened upon by chance. How was it that final night where Maro fought the wizard? Where Dalam sat upon this rock, watching the end? A storm... The priest of Meridas tried to extend the captain's love's life just long enough while Maro sought to buy more time. She was pregnant. With me. This is where my mother and father died, where a wizard sought to destroy the line of the Strontavedi, destroy the sea people. My father was Maro, and his love was my mother. I am the descendant of the lost captain. He paused. And I was brought here to be killed. Evern sat down, his own mind ringing at the case presented by Valrin. If that is true, if that is the purpose of this, Radahala wanted you here to kill you? How does that serve Misla and Marog? What is the point? Radahala doesn't serve Marog as we think. He is a puppet. He serves the spirit of the wizard who haunts this place, who Makli keeps suppressed. Misla comes to break the wizard free, to end the line of the Strontavedi by killing me, securing domination over the seas and bringing Misla upon the living realm. If Marog would have never been, we'd still have ended up here somehow. I do not know the way or the reason, but it was true that fate brought us here. Now, it just looks like I need to fight both that which tried to destroy me as a baby and now what tries to destroy me as a captain. Evern simply nodded. Then what are your orders, Captain? Rossi and I are ready, but we need to avoid Radahala. He will still try to lead us astray. We should leave, all of us, with Karak and the pirates. We can seek out another ship. We haven't found this parchment, but I'm not even sure we should. Radahala has been leading us to it, but why? Perhaps he seeks redemption? Perhaps he is torn? Valrin looked up at the dust. We'll follow what my mother said to do. We'll use the dust and see where the winds take it. As Valrin placed his hands in the dust, the ward shielding the tower dropped and the winds swept upon them. Valrin lifted the dust. It will lead us to where I must go. The wind captured the dust and shot it across the island, a shimmering glowing stream that went east of the island, flowing in a circle around a spot just off the coast. The rest of it flowed directly toward Misla. There, there is something there, Valrin said. An island or something in the water? Evern pointed. But it seems fate also says to go to Misla. Valrin sighed but smiled slightly. Elera can take me over there to see if it is within the water or perhaps an island where the next piece to the puzzle is. I think we're figuring this out. They headed back down to the village as the sun began to come up. Though, it did not paint the sky in colors of dawn, but simply lit the dark gray skies up just a bit. As they came down near the main hall, Radahala was jumping up and down and throwing things around the village. Calm yourself! Aviam shouted at him. I cannot! Misla comes! We must hurry! We must hurry! Quiet! Ordak shouted. Radahala attempted to throw a rock at Ordak when Valrin drew his sword and jumped between them. What are you doing? 
he shouted. Radahala dropped the rock. I couldn't find you, he said. I was concerned. The next path for us is beneath the island. We must go there. There is a place. Wura draws us there. The Stormborn must enter this sacred place. It is what is ordained. Makli and Karak walked up, seeing Valrin standing with his arms crossed. Oh, so Wura wishes us to go down there? It seems as such, Makli said. There is an awakening across the island in the old places. He looked to Karak. Are the villagers aboard your vessels? Are your crews ready? Aye, Karak said. Makli bowed to Valrin. All workings move forward, Stormborn. Do what is needed. We will protect this island. He walked past Radahala, staring. No, matter. The evil. Though, he said, nodding. There is one who is torn between curse and redemption. Seek out what is fate and let others satisfy that which is demanded. Valrin thought for a moment, looking at those of his crew, and then back to Radahala. He had a plan. You say I must open the way to go where Wura needs me? Is this to help obtain more items of the lost captain? Yes, it is the path. It was revealed to me. Much happens upon this island. We must guard our hearts in the name of Wura. We must resist the evil. I will take you down a secret way, a way I have found. Yes, yes. Valrin looked at his crew. Ilera and Nevron, stay here, mount your dragons, and keep watch. Support Karak and his ships. I go down with Radahala. Melia, Avium, Avorn, and Ordak looked to Valrin, and Evorn especially seemed confused at first, but then he too understood. Take me, Valrin said to Radahala. Let us get this over with. Radahala led them away, taking them around the hall and to the westernmost part of the island. It was here near the water's edge. There was a small tunnel, freshly dug, from the amount of sand thrown out and all over the rocks. The smell here was putrid, and the water near this point was still and filled with dead crabs. A way opened into the ancient structure beneath. Wura says you must access this place to complete what is needed, Radahala said as he floated beside Valrin. Much distaste I have, yes, distaste. I am not a fan of a place such as this. Valrin entered the narrow passage going into the rocks, with the others following just behind him. I have summoned a sand cow, Radahala went on. It will take us to Misla as soon as we have the parchment. That is all we need. We will find it here, you'll see. They came to a doorway leading into another structure. They stopped just short of it. It requires you, yes you, to open it. The structure was obvious Dwemhar ruins. The door had a single crystal switch. He placed his hand on it, and it lit up, the door slowly moving down. Okay, he said, looking to Evern. Captain, we'll take care of it, Evern said. Valrin nodded and began to walk away. What are you doing? You must enter. We cannot proceed without one who can open the path. This path doesn't require me. It just requires one with Dwemhar blood. Avium can open any paths. I have to go. You can't go, Radahala shouted. You must stay. I must do nothing. Avium grabbed Radahala by the throat. I feel the presence upon you. You seek to destroy our captain. You send us into here to die? No, Radahala shouted, squirming. No! At this point, both Ordak and Melia were just staring with wide eyes. I do not send you to die. I protect you. I do. I try. I cannot be treated like this. Radahala attempted to fly away, but Avium cast something Valrin had never seen before. Radahala was caught in an orb of silver. What have you done? You're bound. You will stick with us, and you cannot use your powers to flee. Saint or not, you still are influenced by the powers of old. This place is active, and we will see what works beneath it. But Valrin will do what Valrin would like to do. You're going to explore this place with us. Go, Valrin, Evern said. 
I will lead the crew forward. Do what you need to, and we'll figure this out. And we'll keep the babbling saint secure, Aviam said. Valrin nodded, leaving them with Ordak and Melia still in a state of strange shock. He hurried back up to the village. Elera had not left yet, and Rornick was already on Nora. What's wrong? Elera asked him. Nothing, but we've got to go somewhere. You're not with the others? Nevron asked. No, they go down into the ruins of this place with Radahala. And he was okay with this? Alara asked. No, but he doesn't have a choice. What is happening, Valrin? Nevron asked. There have only been whispers of what was afoot. I think Marog is going to attack the island. Radahala is both betraying and trying to help us. I'm figuring stuff out, he said out of breath. Support Kerak. Elera and I head for an island off the coast or something. Or something. I love these kinds of plans. Keep yourselves well. I'll keep a watch from above. Nevron and Nora flew out the eastern side of the island, moving with haste up and around the sheer rock. And we go? East. There is either an island or something. Rornuk lumbered over, growling slightly before shaking his head as if he were shaking water off. The dragons have been restless, Alara said. Not the greatest situation for them. Plus, the weather is getting worse. As they climbed onto the dragon's back, the wind tore through the village. Mockley was standing nearby with his staff and a large torch. I will keep the light of Mereda's burning here. It is a safe point for you, Valrin. I await your return. As Rornuk began to beat his wings, Valrin's stomach twisted. He felt a strange tie to the island, and now he finally believed he had learned his true origin in the world. As they lifted into the sky, flying above the wreck of the lost captain, and then above the top of the island, and where the tower appeared, he thought of who he knew had to be his parents. Now, years later, it was not so long ago that the lost captain lived, and it wasn't so much a legend as it was his own story. Misla was drawing so close, the air had become warm. Fogs rolled across the oceans beneath them. All the while, the storm that had been approaching them was converging with Misla over Eastern Rock Island. Where are we going exactly? Alara asked. Valrin looked over her shoulder, seeing the remnants of the glowing dust that had flowed over from the island. Do you see the glowing area? I think. Why does Misla glow? Apparently, it is my fate to go here and to Misla. Alara looked back at him and then looked forward again. Are you serious? You're telling me the glowing dust is telling you where to go? Yes. Alara shook her head. Okay, okay, I'll go with it. Rornuk banked low, bringing them just to the surface of the water. The waves were growing in size and frequency. The ocean is angry. I've flown over here recently. I didn't see anything, but I can tell you the water is much rougher. Whatever is here is a key to everything else. Alara, I think my parents were the lost captain and his love. But that story is from a long time ago, she said. And who told it to us? Radahala. She nodded. Alara had obviously been preparing just like Karak. There were several cruel spears in the spear holders that were previously empty after the events at Ayeklo. You knew something was going on if you prepared with spears. Nevron did because he saw the pirates doing do. I think he thought we might need to fight them. But we've been enjoying our time here, and it didn't make sense. But yet it did. Now, it looks like we will be fighting Marag one last time. Is that what you think? I don't know. I don't think it will be that simple. But Misla is coming. We're falling into a trap, but I think we were always to come here, just not with Misla, too. There is a presence on the island, a presence that is malevolent and seeks to destroy me. It works well that Marag wants the same, and it just so happens that it all converges. Radahala seems neither evil nor good, but he's a soul torn between two masters. The god Wura and whatever evil pulls him to act. So you're saying Rornuk shouldn't eat him? She teased. 
No, not yet at least. They were coming up on the mists that were unlike that of Misla or anywhere else. As Rornuk began to slow from Alara pulling back on the reins, they found a small island not even big enough for the dragon to land on. Valrin jumped down, and Alara followed. He glanced around as fairies flew over and around them. Above, the storm rolled over top them, striking at the mists of Misla with blue lightning, striking Misla itself. Thunder rattled the air around them, and though there was a feeling of desperation in the air, the sounds of the water crashing onto the rocks around them gave Valrin some form of calmness. Suddenly, a wave crashed over them, nearly overtaking them both. Rornuk roared above them, and Valrin grabbed Alara by the arm. The waters receded, and a broken bit of metal wreckage was left in the wake of the wave. Valrin went to it. How in the glacial seas is this even here? It was a turtle, one of the ones from the Ayla Sunrise. This is impossible! The storm above them rumbled, and more lightning struck Misla. The gods give you favor, Alara said. It's wrecked. I cannot use this for anything. I don't even have my ship. Valrin began to search the tiny island. I was sent to this island for a reason, not to get wreckage. What is here? Where is the parchment? What am I to do? But there was no answer at all. The winds were deafening. As Valrin began to pick up the turtle in its crumbled and broken form, Elera tapped him on his shoulder. Valrin, they're here. He jumped up, looking out toward Misla and seeing the tall bronze ships of Morag and hundreds of smaller ships. Valrin dropped the wreckage of the turtle. We can't defeat that. Not now. We have nothing. He fell to his knees. I knew there was something. I just knew it. Everything was making sense, and now more will die because of me. I can't defeat that with some pirates and a crew without our ship. Suddenly, the jar containing the ashes of Tritnu began to shake. He lifted it and noticed it was glowing as had been the island. What is it? Tritnu, a bit of a teacher. In a jar? It's a long story. Just... Give me a few minutes. He poured out some of the sand and suddenly found himself standing atop a version of Eastern Rock Island. Tritnu held his spear in hand and stood with his arms crossed. Quite an inconvenient time you've picked, Valrin said. A true inconvenience is dying. Consider this a mere courtesy. You have happened upon a curious place. Part 5. The Other Path. He's going alone? Ordak asked. He is going with Elera, Evern said. We have our path. We will take it. This isn't what should happen, Radahala said. This isn't right. Quiet, fiend. I care little of your musing or mutterings. We go forward, figure out what is here, and keep the focus of Valrin, Evern said. Radahala laughed. The focus on the Stormborn regardless of what you do. What did the imp say? Ordak shouted. Ignore him, Aviam said. He is powerless. He has been honestly powerless before this. I looked into his mind while we were at the temple of the Saint of Dimon. He is weak. They proceeded forward, taking the path through the doorway and directly down into another chamber by way of a single narrow hallway. Evern looked at the edges of this place and noticed that the rock had been worn away as if this passage had been blocked but made clear. This is recent, Melia then said. What do you mean? Evern asked. She picked up a pickaxe from the ground. The wood on this handle is new. It isn't ancient and it isn't weathered. This path was made recently. What does that mean? Ordak asked. It means we're walking into something. They continued forward, coming to yet another doorway requiring a Dwemar to access. Aviam reached out while still holding a grip on Radahala. This door opened to a massive cavern, with waterfalls falling from high above and the sounds of the oceans beneath them. It was here they could see what the island used to look like before whatever had burned and melted it, and thousands of years of weathering had torn off more aspects on the outside of what was beneath the surface now. Ornate structures rose up as far as they could see, 
standing on broken plateaus of rock, and a sheer wall with crystals within the stone glimmered in the mass lights of this hidden trove. A single pathway, barren on both sides of any railing and leading directly down to a lower portion of the ruins, lay bare before them. Stick close to one another, watch the edges. We move forward to discover our purpose here, Evern said. Rossi jumped down and slithered ahead of them. Not much sure I like this. Not too crazy of ruins with steep drop-offs along the pathway, Ordak said, looking at either side of the path. No, they're not the greatest, Aviam said. As Avorn came to a turn in the path, he noticed they were passing through already open gateways. Rossi slithered back onto him as they passed through, the serpent sitting on his shoulder. They walked through a dark hall, with long halls leading off it, that Evern had no clue of what could be hiding in the shadows. Even with his sight being more useful in the darkness, he couldn't see anything. As Milia, who was at the back of the line, passed through, the doors slammed behind them. Evern ignited his staff, a blazing fire revealing a summoned spell of darkness that he burned away, revealing a much more open path ahead. They were entering into a large open atrium of sorts. As they emerged through and into the atrium, they looked ahead to find a dozen masked figures. Evern sighed quite audibly. Milia drew her sword as Ordak drew his daggers. Evorn lowered his staff and stepped out from the others. In the name of Morog, you will release Radahala. He is ours, a servant unwilling, but a servant to us. This figure had the largest mask and long pointed ears. It sounded like a female from the voice, and Evern noticed she had a staff with a crystal in it. That's a nice staff. I like it. I just got a new one myself, but it's rather fire-based. Where'd you get yours? You will give over, Radahala, Stormborn. Your games are at an end. You struck our god, insulted Marog, and now he brings destruction upon you. He is wise and knows both of the Dwemhar and those who came after the floods. He knows the curse of the lost captain, and you will die upon this island either by our hand or the demon. Pick now. I'd say our way will be less painful. Avaim held her one hand up, ready to cast, as Evern turned and looked at her. See, this is why I preferred my island. People just don't like a good conversation. He turned back to the masked form. So, where did you get the staff from? The masked form walked toward him. You have lost everything, Stormborn. You alone can come to this place. That is the way it was made. The outer doors could not be opened. We alone got entry by using your ship. It is quite useful. It was then ever noticed that there was a ship nearly visible, the mast alone sticking above the rocks across the way from them. You brought my ship. Now that's a good conversation. You have no ship, Stormborn. You keep saying that name, yet you do rely just on a botched version of security to verify your thoughts. Do I look like a captain, you overgrown-faced shadow elf? Do you not see that behind that mask you and I are the same race? Did your god not tell you that this captain you seek is a boy to our eyes? There was a moment of utter silence. The masked form looked at the others, and then her eyes began to glow. Evium immediately reached out with both hands, shielding them as fire rolled over them. There was a shattering sound, and Radahala shot out of the spell Evium had been holding him under, taking advantage in Evium's focus no longer being on him. Evorn slammed his staff, creating another ward around them. There was a deep laugh in the air, and the warmth of the air was snapped to cold. I have no power, Aviam. Radahala was floating high above them all. I had no power, you wretched bitch. But here I am vile. I consume. I need no puppet, though I have held this one as long as he's been here. I do desire to meet this Marog, for I know I may wish to devour him as I devoured others. You are not the Stormborn, but now this place is opened. I have been released, and no longer must I stay in these ruins. I will destroy the sanctum of the god that holds power here, slay his priest, and destroy the Stormborn. 
may you all die in the collapse of this ruin. A blast radiated out from Radahala as a massive gaping hole was made in the upper ceiling of the cavern. The ruins began to rumble and shake as boulders fell, crashing down into the ruins. Morag's followers fled, sending several blasts of fire toward the crew, but Evern was quick to return the casting, striking one of them in the back. Evern ran forward as Rossi slithered even faster, striking the one who had fallen. As they came up the stone of the upper portion of the ruins where Morag's followers had been, they noticed a large open expanse like a courtyard of stone. Those who had been threatening them were running for a ship, the ship, the Ayla Sunrise. Avium! Evern shouted. Stop them! More boulders were coming down upon them, and Evern used his staff to blast apart the rocks as they fell, pushing them with his spells into a line and working to form a tunnel in the debris as Avium floated above the ground, summoning her energies around her. Milia and Ordak stayed directly by Ivorn, he having managed to create a dome of protection from the crumbling stone and quick shifts between using flames from his staff and his own innate magic. He drank one of his potions and then cast vines to shield them further, weaving a tunnel that went toward the water and the docks in which he saw the Ayla Sunrise sitting. Here, it looked like there was some type of docking place for the Akan of old. Marog had managed to use the Ayla Sunrise to go underwater and access this place. It was true that the dark spirit of Elu knew seemingly all the secrets of Elu's technology, or a much scarier thought, was learning more. Avon had made enough of a shelter that there was a path leading to the Ayla Sunrise. As he emerged from the tunnel, he saw Avium cast a series of white blasts, striking all along the deck of the Ayla Sunrise. Three more of the masked forms fell, burning all over from white fire. But at the helm, there was the one who had been threatening them before. The center mast of the ship began to glow bright red, and a blast of fire struck Evium as the ship drifted away, submerging into the water. Avium dropped to the ground. Having created a hasty ward, she blocked the fire, but she was burned on her arms. Damn them, Avium said. The ruins continued to shake, and more chunks of structure and rocks were falling around them. Evern passed her a potion, and she chugged it. We've got to get out of here, Ordak said. Avaeum nodded, looking up. Follow me to the center of the room. Do you have a plan? Evern asked. I'm making one. Just keep the rocks off me. Avium lifted her hands, her eyes turning white. Circles appeared on the floor. The floor began to glow bright blue as more circles appeared within the circles. Evorn felt the circles forming under his boots, and slowly they began to lift off the ground. Oh, heights! No, 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 Ordak said as they lifted upward. Would you rather be crushed? Because this is how you get crushed to death, Milia said. Nope, I just don't like it. Not something this orc likes at all. Ever noticed they were rising into another chamber, and there was still quite a distance to reach the outside. This was also the path the demon had taken. It seems we know our enemy here. As Avium lifted them out of the collapsing cavern, she halted their ascent to the next level. Instead, she pushed them into this chamber they were in. Evern looked down and felt his stomach churn a bit at the height. Though his feet felt as if they were on solid ground, it didn't change the fact that it was like they were standing on glass with just a bit of a foggy glow beneath them. Once they were over solid ground, Avium lowered them. She opened her eyes and looked at Evern. If we keep going up, I fear the demon will act upon me mid-spell. It is better we follow this. I sense it leads out to the beach, though we may have to do some unintentional mining. She smirked. Ever nodded. No, this is good. We will follow your senses to the outside world. The demon will be waiting for Valrin. We need to help him. And we still do not know what else Marog has planned. Part 6. Hadradala. Valrin stared at Tritnu. My crew is descending into the ruins of a Dwemhar structure, 
and I and my other crew member are standing on a barren island with a broken Dwemhar construct, and you pick now to train? I find now a good time to discuss that which you must learn. You are upon the path as you should have been. Through other events, you would have found another teacher like myself to teach you the words of the gods, to use the magic as you have been instructed. This was meant to assist you as Stormborn, as the descendant of the ones I know you understand as the Stranta Vedi. I have been told the story and understand it. This was meant by Meridas to be your final step before you were ready for the full task of Stormborn, to go with those of Erlas. Until I lost my ship. Until Marog, Tritnu said. His presence is like a stain on the parchment already set in motion. You must defeat him and Misla to return all two as it should be. You take me into training to tell me what I already know? No, I complete a part of your training you're missing. You must learn that called Hadradala. Valrin nodded. I saw this in a vision. Tritnu smiled. Then you know its importance. It severs a magical being or spirit from the host body. Then you may strike it with Hawk and Rock, smiting it. Dwemhar blades like what you have at your hip are one of the few weapons capable of piercing a demon. So I understand it. This lesson will be short. You either get this or you do not. Okay. In order to invoke Hadradala, you must sacrifice a portion of your life force, a splice of you. This was a technique of the Dwemhar Templar, beings capable of much more than that of the Strantavedi. Though you have the blood, you cannot break yourself and then restore it. If this is done too much, you'll destroy yourself. Valrin was speechless. Though he had learned much in the last few weeks, nothing had been to this level. It must be done to strike the demon that has haunted all the sea captains of the Strantavedi. From your conception, you were known to the Strantavedi, the sea people, that you were to remain and outlast all else. It was your father who struck the demon the first time, fracturing the original wizard and breaking him. But at that moment, gaining a part of your father's soul, he learned of you. The dark wizard sought to use the power within you, within your mother's womb, to forge a weapon of his own design. Your father chased him down and fought him, but by then your mother was nearly dead. Your father could not risk failing to fully destroy the demon. He had not a Dwemhar blade in which to stop the demon, so he used the power of his ship to bind the demon here. In the end, he held the demon with all his might until you were born and taken by Meridas away from this island. As it is spoken, it is as it was. You were left at Trava, far from this place. The Ayala Sunrise was the greatest creation of the Strantavedi, and you alone were meant to be its captain. Your necklace that tied you to the vessel was the same one that your mother wore when you were born. He paused. Your mother and father have always been with you, Valrin. Now it is time for you to unchain the demon from this island and defeat it. But Marog, he is here. Marog is your enemy, yes, but you cannot move forward until you do this. Marog is next, and I can't say how many will die because of him, but this is your path as Stormborn. Secure this, and then deal with the other. Just like this, though, only you can defeat Marog, but I and the gods of the North are giving you all that we can. And my crew? The pirates here. Makli. I do not know, Tritnu said. This was meant to be the final challenge for you, Valrin. You were set on this path after the events at Orlas, but much happened that was not intended. He shook his head. I can't predict what will happen, but I can say it is within your power to stop it if you believe. Valrin drew his sword. I don't know what I believe, but I will do what I need to protect my crew and the seas. That is enough. Keep that in focus. What was sent to destroy the Strantavedi was an enemy of the Dwemhar. In the primordial times, before the elves and dwarves awoke, there were void demons, 
a byproduct of creation, sealed between the realms and angry to emerge. Though many Dwemar fought them and destroyed ones that slipped through, others were not so overt. In this case, they possessed a wizard in the Shadowlands, and through him hunted down the many sea captains. I cannot have you perform the Hadradala here, but I want you to feel what it is you must feel to summon it. Then how will I know if I can? If you cannot when the time comes, then it matters little, for all other paths will fail. The Hadradala is how your full meaning as Stormborn will come through. There is a darkness beyond these seas, and Marog tied to the rise of those in Urlas. It is your purpose to strike down that darkness, your purpose to stop those called the Itsu. It was foreseen, and it is beyond the gods of the north to stop, for they cannot see what the Itsu do. This enemy will be beyond the gods, a servant, a priest of some kind, but that you will embrace in time. Suddenly, the top of the eastern rock island became like a polished floor. Valrin's sword was sheathed, and at his side, there were people dancing and grand windows looking out to the ocean. He was standing with a glass of wine, and there were others dressed as he. Captain, a voice said. He turned to see Idanos. You're looking quite the captain, if I must say so, Idanos said. Thank you, Valrin said, shaking. He wasn't sure what this was or why he was seeing Idanos. Look at them, Idanos said. Look at all of us. Valrin looked around, noticing that all of those at this strange party were dressed nearly the same, even Valrin. It is a beautiful assembly now, at the end. It was then the windows shattered around them in a crashing clamor and wind tore through the great hall in which they all stood. The other captains were suddenly grotesque, with injuries of every kind. Some were now on fire and collapsing. Others were skewered with spears or swords. Still, others were bloated as if they had been lost under the depths of the seas for days. He turned to look at Adanos and saw him as he saw him the last time in Urlas when he died. Death is not too bad, Adanos said. Blood ran from his mouth and nose, and he collapsed into Valrin's arms. The winds blew open a door at the end of the hall, and in came a glowing white ghost. He saw the image of someone with two burning red elvish blades leap upon the white being, and then he saw another strike from the other side with a glowing white sword. Then it all shifted. The building collapsed around him, and he saw Ayelko. He saw the spirit of Marog and the Ayala sunrise fighting, and a blast of energy as Bry fell upon Marog. He then saw as if he was Marog, seeing Bry's face as electricity surged through her body, and Marog stabbed her, throwing her into the ocean. He felt at that moment that he could take her place, throw himself into her position, and save her from the very sword that ran upon her. He shifted into position, staring Marog down, and then nothing. Valrin couldn't see for a moment, but then opened his eyes to see Tritnu standing before him. You see, the lesson is a simple one. You have your need. I would have taken her place if it meant saving her. As your father saw when your mother fell from the cliffs, it is how he summoned that power. It is how he broke the physical body of the wizard and the demon. He put himself in the position he wished he could be in to save your mother, and then again, to save you when at last he fell upon this very island. What else was that? The white spirit or ghost? I saw a figure with burning red swords, and I saw another, I think. I think it was me. But then it was torn away. Tritnu thought long, stroking his chin. Not a part of the training, but perhaps you saw a glimpse of what was going to be if the path to Ayaklo would not have shifted what it did. Perhaps you saw what moment you were meant to have as Stormborn, helping those of Erlas. I cannot know for sure, just as you cannot, for that path is not as it will be in the end. Now, I have taught you all I can for now. There is still more, more especially if the gods determine the Itsu assist Marog, but for now, go. End this.
end the plague that has stricken all the Strontavedi. Secure your place, Captain. Valrin suddenly was back upon the island with Alera. Whoa, Valrin. You just blanked out for a good thirty seconds. Your eyes were white. That was... strange. It's time to go, he said to her. Just like that? He knelt and gathered the crumbled parts of the turtle, securing them to his waist. I don't know how this fits together, but it will come with us regardless. I must get back to the island. Elera signaled Rornuk. As the dragon swooped down low, hovering in place, she climbed onto his back and pulled Valrin up. They began to rise into the sky, flapping higher and higher as sudden flames lit the ocean in the distance. It was Nevron and Nura and the fleet of Morag. We've got to get over there, Alara said. We can't, not yet. I have to get to the island. Orbs of energy began to fly up and out of the fogs, striking the water near Kerak's fleet. Rornuk began to struggle to fly, turbulent winds wrapping around him as they drew closer to the island. Fogs rolled over them, and Valrin felt a presence upon them. He closed his eyes, focusing the spell of Hamrasu in his mind. He opened his eyes, crying loud, Hamrasu! A blast of energy erupted from him, knocking back the fogs and keeping them on a straight path for the island. But the fogs were chasing them now. They were nearly at the cove when the water exploded, and of all possible sights, Valrin spotted the Aela Sunrise. Alara banked with Rornuk to the right as the Aela Sunrise's weapons engaged, sending a volley of spells at her. Rornuk was caught in a downdraft on the edge of the island, but as both a blessing and a curse, the Aela Sunrise was fleeing and headed back to Misla. Rornuk struggled to fly back toward the island, and the fogs were nearly upon them. Elera was just above the water, and the waves were rolling beneath them. He could see into the village of Eastern Rock Island and the torch Makli had lit. Yet he saw shadows and blasts of blue fire. Makli was fighting, alone. More wind shot around Rornuk as they tried to get closer. It isn't going to work. Drop me in the water. Go assist Nevron. What? How? You can't swim that! I don't plan to, Valrin said, unstringing his wave-sliding board. You've barely done that. It's the only way. I've got to get to Makli. This is my fight to finish. Protect the others. Watch for the rest of the crew if you can get close enough to the island. I will finish this. As Rornuk dipped close to the water again, Valrin jumped, grabbing hold of his board and holding on as he struck the water. He went under for a moment, but kept a strong grip on his board, kicking up to the surface. Breaching, he looked around. He could feel the rumbles of weapon fire from the fleet of Misla and the roars of Rornuk and Nura, followed by fire and ice striking the ocean in the distance. He watched the crests of the waves, seeing that the tide was much higher. He pulled himself up onto the board, the etching of the shark underneath his chest. He began to paddle in, alternating hand strokes while realizing how much harder this was with a sword, gear, and the mechanical construct on his back. Ahead, he could see blackness hovering in the air of the village and the flash of blue and white. That was Makli, who knew it. He had to get there. The ocean roared and the wind cut across him, but he paddled hard, glancing back and seeing a wave rolling underneath him. Wait to feel it pull your legs and stomach. I have to wait. The first wave rolled over him, and then the second did the same. Suddenly, he felt himself moving backward, and he paddled hard, pushing up to his feet and then standing, feeling the board beneath his feet. He staggered, but then felt his footing shift. Just like sailing? He said to himself, questioning. He rode atop the wave, this one by some feet of Maradas, taking him all the way into the cove. He fell off the board and shuffled in the shallow water, throwing it on his back. He drew his blade and ran up the beach. The entire air around the island had changed. There were what seemed to be black flames rolling on the underside of the island, in the caverns above the village itself. Makli was in the center of the village, 
his staff out and his dagger in hand. He spotted Valrin and ran forward. No, Valrin! Valrin lifted his sword just as a series of arrows whistled through the air. Makli was there, crafting a ward in just enough time. They are here, many of the masked ones of Marog, Makli said, grabbing his tunic and pulling him back toward the beach. But there is another. You have gotten this far. You know of what awaits you, what threatened your father. The dark wizard, the demon. I know. I can defeat it. Shouting filled the air above them, and in the level of the village, many masked forms appeared. Valrin lifted his sword, but now these figures were wrapped in the same black fire that licked the rock of the island. There is much power in this place. Long have I been held in the void. Long have I awaited the descendant of the Stranta Vedi, but I hear of another, a being of malice. Marog these masked ones worship. I would very much like to see this one. Marog is but a glimmer of what greatness existed in the Dwemhar, Valrin shouted. You can use his warriors as mere pawns if you are simply too afraid to face me yourself. Valrin, Makli said, the gods are with you. This is your destiny. Defeat this entity, claim your birthright, and it will be done. As Valrin stared out at the warriors of Marog wrapped in the malice of the demon, he looked back to Makli. I can't help but feel this isn't how it was supposed to be, like I've made a bigger disaster than it was meant to be. Misla can wait, defeat the demon, claim all that is yours, that is your next step, then the Stormborn will drown Marog and all his minions. Makli nodded and smiled. For the Strantavedi, then? No, for my father and mother. Valrin charged forward, alone, moving directly into the fray with his Dwemhar blade held aloft in front of him. The demon released his hold on Marog's forces, and in a moment of confusion as to what had happened, Valrin cut into each of them, taking the first two with slashes to the neck, spraying their blood across the rocks. He leaped at the next, catching a jab with this one's spear, before parrying sideways and slashing across their robed back. Another masked form fell. From a good distance away, a call for arrows rang out, and it was now Valrin realized there were several ships of Marog stuck in the shallows of the island. He rolled forward, moving into the cover of the village and making his way around the hall. Is this it, demon? Do you use another's minions to do your work? There was no response. Valrin followed the rocks, moving up higher and to a point above the ships. More of Marog's warriors moved onto the island from what was actually two ships stuck in the shallows. Archers had arrows notched on the ships, but did not fire. He had managed to move away fast enough that they had lost sight of him. Hawk and Rock! he shouted, swinging his sword down and sending a bolt of lightning into both vessels, splintering them in an explosion of wood and water. The storm coming in from the east dropped water spouts into the oceans west of the island. As it were, more ships of Marog were coming around, but this caused them to quickly turn away. He looked back toward the wave-sliding cove and saw that Misla was now in view. The storm and Misla were converging on the island. He moved back down into the village, finding Makli had vanished. Those of Marog were searching for both of them, one of them turned and went to shout when the malice of the demon grabbed them once again. I tire. I destroy. Those of Marog began to seize, coughing up fluid, their eyes bulging in their skulls as they collapsed. The fire fell upon the ground like a sludge of black grime, growing in size many times. The water began to rise, the waves blowing the water across the island. What is a captain without his ship? What is this? The waters were coming up quick, and Valrin jumped, pulling himself atop a building. The demon was flooding the entire level. No captain without his ship. The demon laughed deep and long. Drown, that is what you'll do. I seek another now anyway. Why take the Stormborn when I can take the darkness of a Dwemhar with the holy blood of old, the real blood, 
not the sea people piss. It was then Radahala appeared crawling from a crevice to his right side, a broken portion of a roof. The demon was undulating with energy from the surrounding structure, glowing brighter and brighter as the water rose more. You! Valrin shouted. Oh, Stormborn, I'm terribly sorry, yes, so sorry! Radahala was crying and bleeding from his nose and ears. I could not! I could not do anything! You betrayed me. You are the same as that who betrayed my father. No, no, it wasn't meant to be like that. I was betrayed first. I hold my power still, but... Valrin angled his blade at him. I care not for any lies you vomit up. This is over. Radahala nodded. Yes, Stormborn, it is. I will not betray another. I will not be used. I am still a saint. I will do as a saint should in the name of the North. Valrin cocked his head as Radahala grew several times in size in a matter of moments, becoming as a wishing smoke, green in color with flashing white eyes. I give up my life for the glory of my god. I will hold this demon for a time. You must claim that of your father. The demon began to laugh, his form growing double that of Radahala. Betray me. You will not live, and he shall never claim that of his wretched father. The two titans began to duel and smack one another. The demon sprouted many arms, grappling the genie, who drew out a large blade, slashing off two of the arms before he was forced to the ground. Valrin, Mackley said. Come, come! The priest was swimming toward him. As the demon and genie fought one another, he pulled Mackley from the water. I understand, though I question, but the construct, the thing on your back, that is something of your ship, something of the ale a sunrise. I don't get it, and it doesn't help me. I don't have my ship. Something works for you, Valrin, a spirit not of this world, yet not of death, the storm itself. That great storm is an ally like none other. I have a way, a way to control the water. He lifted his dagger. This, he said. I can lower the water and allow you to the ruin you saw, the crystal, right? How does that? Mackley smiled. I bear all I must now, at the end. Your father's ship was but a realm ship of old, like your own, but not yours. Yours was the secret, the true vessel of the Stormborn. There is a place beneath here, a place secret even to many Dwemhar. When I laid eyes on the construct, I understood my purpose to still live. It is to give you what you need beyond the death meant for you here by the demon. Long have I waited. Now it is revealed to me, and I will reveal it to you. Follow me. Follow me. The priest placed his staff in the water. Meridas, Meridas, hear my prayer. Send your creatures both far and near. Bring us friends. As the water swirled around them, Valrin saw something to the side. Valrin! a voice shouted. It was Evern, swimming up from a random gap in the rock. Several narwhals swam into the flooded village. Mackley, send the narwhals to my crew. Get them out of here. At that moment, more than a dozen glacial sharks swam in, moving toward Evern and the others. The sharks will carry your friends from here. The narwhals are for us. The genie screamed, first loud and high-pitched, and then low. A rumbling sound shook the entire island, and the demon was wrapped in a massive enveloping smoke and pulled out from the island. Now we go, Mackley shouted, as Evorn and the others held on to the sharks and were pulled from the flooded village, Valrin swam to the narwhals. One in particular swam to him. It was the one called Tulasiro. My friend, Valrin said, thank you. Tulasiro squeaked, and Valrin held onto its back as Mockley sat up on top of his narwhal. They moved directly out of the flooded village as even now more water filled the cavernous place. Mockley pointed his dagger at the water, making a swirling opening that led straight down into the lower area of the ruins. Will it not be flooded? 
No, it was a place that could only be gotten to via a realm ship, a safeguard or portal, I guess. Slide down to it. I'll hold the way open. What is down here? Valrin asked. What you are missing? To Lasiro, my friend. It was a short but good ride. Valrin let go of the narwhal and touched the swirling magic from the dagger, moving with haste down to the door beneath the surface of the water. There was a glowing crystal above it. This was what he saw before when he was wave-sliding for the first time. He pushed on the door and instantly was inside. The entire room he appeared in began to glow. He saw crystals light up along the walls, and a glowing form of a man appeared before him. Welcome, all sequences remain as left. Device detection, damaged reconstructor, please place on the floor. The voice was strange and monotoned. It reminded Valrin of the Guardian construct back on Iaclo when they went back in time. He unstrapped the broken turtle and set it on the floor. Damage substantial. Repair needed. Several crystals of differing colors floated up from the floor, moving around the turtle. The broken metal was fused back together, and a new crystal placed itself into the back of the turtle. Valrin began to look around the room, noticing that he had seen such a place before. But it was a long time ago. I remember the place with Edenos, back before I got the Ayla Sunrise, the ruins and the vision of the Sea Peoples. This, this is one of their structures. It must have been one of their last, and because it was sealed, it remained. What is this place called? This place is Substructure Stranta Vedi, Valrinta, Valrinta. He laughed a bit at himself. My name comes from here? Valrinta, the third family of the Stranta Vedi, Sea Captain Eight Moon Admirals, Descendants. One, last known location, Shadowlands, Clan Tua, born during the Great Storm. The turtle was beginning to glow, and several more crystals were being fused to its body. Who took the descendant to the Shadowlands? Unknown exact. Deity presence. A god? Confirmed! Now Valrin knew. He knew his family name was his own. The family Valrinta was obviously tied to his own name. He was taken to Clan Tua, which was how he came to be with his Aunt Tua, and she fled with him to the glacial seas, both for herself and his protection. But that would mean he was much older than what he thought, or that he had time traveled. Repair complete! Valrin knelt to the turtle, and it came to him. It looked nothing like his turtles on the Ayla sunrise. It had a narrower build now, a fusion of parts both of older design and the newer design of the Ayla sunrise. Realm ship located, beginning temporal shift. Captain acquired. Wait, what? Valrin felt a snap, and his entire body felt as if it was being torn to one side. He felt another snap, and he was standing at a helm. The water was all around him, and it looked from his point of view that his ship was going up against a wave. It was then he realized where he was. He was on the wreck of the lost captain, his father's ship, the Nakri. The turtle immediately went to work on the ship, moving with haste to fuse the boards and add material. He had never seen one of the constructs move so quickly. It ran to the back of the ship, replacing crystals before continuing its work. Crystals began to spin along the deck of the ship and made a rather horrid sound for what he expected, cranking and crackling. He went down to where the massive crack was in the ship and saw that it was almost fused back together, except for the massive rock jutting up through part of it. The water began to roll up in a giant wave, pushed from the oceans outside the island. The demon held the genie under the surface, shoving him face first into the sheer rock of the island. The corresponding wave struck underneath the Nakri, pushing it up and off the rocky crag it had originally come to rest on. The turtle went to work as the ocean splashed over the deck. In a few moments, the hole that had remained was sealed. Valrin held tight to the wheel, angling the rudder of the ship away from the island and the rocks as the demon pulled the genie atop the island, punching him over and over in the face. 
The turtle spun in place, deploying two angulated crystals before casting a beam of energy toward the center mast of the ship. A massive sail appeared, and the turtle moved about the ship, tying the sail as appropriate. When at last there was a single line remaining, the turtle went to Valrin and offered the line. He claimed it, pulling it taut and tying it down. Wind flowed into the sail, and he ran back to the wheel. As his hands gripped the wheel, he felt small pokes in his fingertips. The woods had splintered under his grip. He looked at his hands, and his blood ran across the wheel. The shard sticking out from the wheel retracted. That was intentional. Suddenly the ship brimmed with energy and hummed. The water was moving higher, and now only the very top of the island was visible. Valrin shifted the sails. A gust catching pushed him along the edge of the island. The great western storm had met with Misla, lightning striking the oceans around him. He looked out, seeing the fleet of Karak slowly retreating to the island, with both Rornuk and Nura attempting to cover them. One vessel was closer than the rest, and it appeared to be heading for the opposite side of the island, perhaps to get Makli. Valrin looked back at the demon atop the island and watched as he continued to repeatedly strike the genie, white blood splashing upon the top of the island. Valrin knelt at the helm, looking for something, anything like the Ayla sunrise. There were no levers underneath the helm. There were not manual weapons to fire. He gripped the wheel, reaching out with his mind for some amount of foresight, but none came to him. It was a realm ship, but it was nothing like the Ayla Sunrise. Yvonne looked out from the deck of Carrick's vessel, the Hammer. The pirate's vessel had scorch marks from the arcane flames, and through a feat of luck, the tides had worked with them and against the enemy fleet of Misla. They had to get closer to the island. Eviam, do you sense anything? Only that Valrin is alive. The demon is at a level of power I have rarely felt in the world. Man overboard, Karak shouted. Evern looked and saw several narwhals off the bow of the ship. Makli was with them. He ran down to the edge of the ship and worked with the crew to pull the priest onto the ship. He was shivering uncontrollably. Quite cold, quite cold he said. The crew covered him in blankets, and he pulled himself to look up toward what remained of the island. The water had risen like a great hill, encompassing the island. Valrin, where is Valrin? He has secured his path forward. He moves toward the final step. Makli paused, staring up at Misla. As long as Marog stays where he needs to. At that moment, Evorn saw the mast of another ship moving about the island. The demon moved toward it in haste. Blessed Morrow, Karak shouted. That's the Nakri! The demon grew in size, black wings stretching across the width of the island as it reached for the Nakri. Hawk and rock! Valrin shouted, bringing his sword downward and sending a blast of lightning into the demon. Though he couldn't find any weapons, he used what he had and landed a strike. The ship ran aground on the island, and Valrin ran toward the edge of the railing, his foot bumping up against a box. A latch fell open, and several red spears with white spear tips fell onto the deck. You are a weakling. What kind of Strontavedi are you? Valrin took a spear in hand, arching his throw and tossing it toward the demon. As he did, crystals spun along the deck of the Nakri, sending energy with the spear and propelling it even faster into the flesh of the demon. An explosion of white overtook it, and it hissed, reaching out again. Valrin threw another, followed by another. Both struck, sending ripples of energy crackling into the sky. The demon fell back, and Valrin grabbed several spears, jumping from the ship and tossing them one after another at the beast. With each explosion, the demon recoiled faster until at last, when Valrin had but two spears left, it charged him. Valrin threw one spear and then dove out of the way as the monstrous form attempted to stomp him. He drew his Dwemar blade, running now toward the far edge of the island. In the distance he could tell Elera and Nevron were attempting to get closer, 
but the water surrounding the island whipped up, lashing out at them. This was a fight for Valrin and Valrin alone. The demon lumbered toward him. Long have I been bound, only grasping the minds of the weaker to see outside this place. I sought a supreme being. I sought a Dwemhar. But as the years sped by, I found Iaclo to be a nexus. There were many I inhabited then, but I saw the showdown between you, Marog, and the Scourge Siren. That was power, and I knew I had to have it. Then stop talking and come take it! The demon laughed, a crown of fire appearing atop his head. A prince does not believe you have power comparable, but still, I play this game. I face you. Your bloodline is dead. Your father was destroyed foolishly fighting me upon a broken ship that... He paused, glaring at the Nakri. Somehow you repair. I am the Stormborn, born upon this island after you tried to murder my mother. My father died protecting me and her, and I have lived on to face you now. I will claim victory. The demon smiled, its black form curling lips of flames. I still murdered your mother no matter what your father did. They failed. I live. They didn't fail. Valrin sprinted forward, leaping toward the demon. Hawk and rock! Thunder rolled and lightning flashed forward, striking the beast. Valrin knew the next step, the next spell. He could keep attacking, but it would do no good. The demon summoned a trident of silver, attempting to stab him. Valrin spun, going to jab the beast with his blade, but was parried. The demon tried to force his position, pushing up and over Valrin, stabbing the trident several times, nearly hitting Valrin each time. But the Stormborn rolled out of the way, jumping again into the fray, making several arching slashes and landing a single hit that blasted the demon back. He focused, feeling his body's movements beginning to align with that of his instinct. He continued fighting as he needed, but his mind was shifting. He had to cast Hadradala. Thunder rolled again, and he summoned Hakenrock, striking the demon again. The storm rolled up behind him, and there were many flashes of blue lightning. You are with me. He could feel Bri within the storm. He could feel her spirit. But she could still be alive if it weren't for Marog. I could have saved her. Anger rose in his chest and he felt a deep pull forward. Energy surged around him. His body felt numb and then focused. He charged sword first, striking the demon with a heavy slash, and then grabbing hold of one of its horns, pulled himself upon its body. He thrust his blade deep into its back, a feeling growing deep within his chest and surging up to his head. Hadradala! A blast ignited the demon, and for a moment he could see the physical form of the demon shatter as energy flowed from his own forehead into the creature. But then he felt cold, a stark shift in the air, and the physical body of the demon burst into blue flames. He felt a presence come upon him. A mere mortal masters the words of the gods. You are not the one called Riakar. You are not the Dwemhar the demon realm feared. Hamrasu, Valrin thought. I have to keep him out. Too late, Stormborn. You will take me to the one who is greater. Valrin fell to his knees, the demon breaking apart before him and the waters falling away from the top of the island. Valrin struggled to breathe. There was a pain in his chest. Though you did cast Hadradala, I have learned to resist it. You may have destroyed part but you didn't destroy all. Do as I command, or I will use you to kill all you hold dear. You will take good care of me, and it will benefit us both for a time. Valrin stood up, his body feeling normal again. He had the sensation he'd had when he was younger after waking from a nightmare. The feeling of convincing himself it was a bad dream and that it never happened, except that in this case, he felt a realization that he didn't know what had happened. He had cast Hadradala, but it wasn't enough. Once again, his actions took him on the path where he could hurt others. 
He had to do something. He had to protect his crew. Part 7. Stranta Vedi. He has struck the demon, Aveum exclaimed. Evun and Makli both had been staring in earnest. As it were, they had seen several flashes from the Dwemhar blade and a blast of white cut into the demon's form. It is done, then. The Stormborn rises to claim his family's honor. His family? Mara was no mere captain of chance. He was the father of the Stormborn who gave his life for the child to be born. Valrin was born upon this island and then taken to a realm of waiting, a time expanse where time did not flow. It is the great secret. He is not of this time, but he is here now. Power still resides deep within him, and he is the promise to return the Dwemhar toward their destined purpose. Karak, take us to shore. Signal the fleet to follow. As it was now, the fleet of Morag was still attempting to get close, but the oceans and tides were working against them. Merida stirs the oceans, giving us grace for a time, Makli said. As they moved closer to the island, Evern realized the island itself had sunk further into the ocean. He saw the Nakri floating off the coast and a lone figure standing on the edge of the island. He smiled, not only seeing that Valrin had survived, but truly proud of what the young boy had accomplished. Though, in truth, it appeared Valrin was from a time even before Evern. It didn't matter, and they had to still deal with Morog. They had completed one task for another to take center focus. As they approached the Nakri, Valrin made his way to the ship, leaping from the rocks above it and landing in the water. As Karak's ship came alongside the ancient ship, Karak's men extended a plank, and Evun, Avium, Milia, and Ordak went over to the other vessel. Valrin was at the helm but seemed troubled in Evun's opinion. It is done. Valrin said. Makli went to cross over to the ship, and Valrin turned the wheel, moving the ship away. The plank fell into the water, and Makli stared out. Evern went to Valrin. Captain? We have to head off Marog's forces. Makli and the others aren't safe. Orders? Ordak asked. Man the spears. As you toss them, the ship will empower them, and they'll tear apart the other vessels. What about Alera and Nevron? Milia asked. They are fine where they are. Ivorn looked out to see the two dragons flying toward them, but struggling in the wind. Aviam and Evern stood beside Valrin. The torn parchment? Aviam asked. Did you find it? Black with green writing? That's what Radahala said? Yes, we don't need it. He lifted the eye of storms and Evern looked at him. What do you see? Our path forward. Keep your wards up. Protect the others. We have one good shot at this. Valrin's stark actions were strange to Evern. He looked to Evium, who seemed as confused as he was. Valrin, are you well? Evium asked. I am well. I am focused. You always talk about that, keeping focus, centered. That is me. Protect Milia and Ordak, down, down to the others, he said. This ship is not like the Aela Sunrise, Evern said. No, it isn't. Evern leaned into Valrin's ear. Stormborn, don't play coy. What happened? You're not talking. I'm talking fine. Watch over the others, Valrin said, staring at him. That is your command from me. Valrin's eyes shifted back to the sea ahead. They were headed directly into the mists of Misla. Marog's vessels were ahead. Evorn saw several smaller ships, and one of the much larger ones with the metal towers, electrified in the mists and appearing to prepare its weapons. Hold spears until we are close! Valrin shouted. Evium, Evorn! Keep your wards up! Protect the crew! They were headed directly at the first two ships. As a volley of spells flew out from the ships ahead, Valrin engaged something that Evorn couldn't see. The ship extended what looked like curved planks off the sides of the vessel. Evium caught the blasts coming from the other ships with her Dwemar powers. 
they were nearly upon the other ships. Spears! Falrin shouted. Melia and Ordak began throwing the spears, the ship's energy engaging and propelling the spears with great force into the two closest ships. Evern felt a clank beneath his feet, and Valrin was at the aft, moving the crystals about and doing something to the ship. Suddenly they were moving faster. Crew, keep together! Avium and Evern, cast a center ward off the front of the ship. Melia, Ordak, brace yourselves! As they pushed through the ocean, leaving the fragments of the first two vessels in their wake, they were on course for the large ship ahead, the ship they had dueled while aboard the Ayala Sunrise, and were only just saved by Eliu back off the coast of Ayaklo. Evern looked around, seeing that they were in the middle of Morag's fleet, and the mists were clearer within the actual wake of the ominous glowing clouds above them. He prayed Valrin actually knew what he was doing. He cast his ward and Avium cast hers. Melia and Ordak still held spears, but clung to the center masts of the Nakri. They were headed directly at the massive vessel ahead of them. Valrin. Hold! Crew! Hold! As he shouted that, a large crystal appeared at the front of the vessel, spinning in unison with several other crystals that appeared at the center of the deck. A stream of fire shot out of the front of the ship, yet it wasn't fire, but a green blast of energy that tore into the vessel ahead of them. The wards he and Ivium held trembled and shook as pieces of ships and Morag's minions flew around them. The Nokri lurched forward with great force, blasting into the ship and splitting it down the middle. Valrin drew his sword, running past them and to the front of the ship. Huck and rock! He blasted apart the rest of the ship, sending a bolt of lightning through the wood around them and splitting open the vessel in a blast of energy that thundered across the entire deck. Valrin ran back to the helm as the ship fell away and only the open ocean was before them. Whoa, damn Valrin, I need to fight a demon, I need some of that power, Ordak shouted, laughing. Good glory to the gods. This isn't the gods, this is the Stranta Vedi, Valrin said. The Dwemar didn't listen to us. Now we'll deal with what a Dwemar created. They were sailing directly toward another vessel. Ivorn stared, making out what it was. Captain, the Ayla Sunrise, the Ayla Sunrise is there. Good, Valrin said. He went back to the crystal, switching out one for another, and then going back to the helm. All of you, brace yourselves. Do you mean to ram your own ship? Avium asked. But Valrin didn't answer. Suddenly, Evern felt them moving faster, and a growing trembling caught his attention. They were on a course for the Ayla Sunrise, but in a sudden shift, they were moving upward. Oh, whoa, no warning, just lifting us up. The ship was arching up. Evern held on to the mast as he saw fire erupting from the back of the Nakri. Valrin was holding the eye of storms in his hands, ascending through the mists, maneuvering around massive rocks and floating towers on the outside of Misla. That which before had been fiery stone appeared as almost a spectral rock, a mirage just on the very of their sight, yet not fully there. Misla was truly between the realms. Valrin took out the dark compass and seemed to adjust their course based on whatever he was seeing. We go for Misla! Milia shouted. Evern waited for Valrin to respond, but he didn't. Prepare yourselves for battle. Ordak, Milia, keep to the inside of Avium and myself. We do not know what Morag has here. He looked over to Valrin. We do not exactly have the plan at all. They were moving in through buildings of an ornate design, now moving alongside a large wall. Blasts of energy began streaking toward them, flying over the deck as orbs of sizzling blue. Evern ran up to the helm. A bit of a revelation, perhaps, but telling us what the plan is would help us. This isn't like you. Valrin stared ahead, dropping the eye of storms and the dark compass. Those are quite useful. They're simple enough to use, Valrin said, 
not looking at Evern. He signaled for the automaton construct, and the turtle scurried to him. He affixed it to the helm. Vals, Evern said. What is it? It is time. Do not ask questions of me. I must do this, and you must prepare. Misla comes. It will swarm the glacial seas and then move for the mainland. Remember, no matter what, I do all things to protect you and the others. We will fight Morog together, Evern said firmly. This will not be like at Iaclo. Valrin blinked tears away. No, never again will things be like what happened at Iaclo. He drew his blade and noticed Ivium staring at him. He shook his head and leaped from the deck of the Nakri, landing on the wall of Misla. Valrin! Evern shouted. The Nakri banked to the right, descending away with haste. Evorn ran to the helm, trying to pry off the turtle. Avium, go, help him! But the ship was falling too fast, moving through the mists beneath the city and down to the ocean. Avern shook his fist, resolving to kick the railings near the helm. The turtle was guiding the ship elsewhere, a final command from Valrin. Why'd he go alone? Ordak asked. Why would he do that? He can't take them all, Melia said. Evaeum went up to the helm as they floated just over the surface of the water. Ivorn went to the side of the railing as Ivaeum joined him. The waters beneath Misla held their own secret, though. Those secrets were laid bare, yet did not seem to care of the Nakri. Their commands came from Marog. Evern looked out to see many tentacled monsters moving just under the depths, a secret force of Marog's. Evern shook his head. Foolish! Why would he do it? Why? His knuckles turned white as he gripped the wood. I don't know, Avium said. You don't know, Evern yelled. You, the Dwemhar who can read minds, have no idea why the Stormborn just abandoned us to face an evil unlike anything we've come across by himself? I don't. He was blocking me out. Since when can Valrin block you out? Damn. Since when does Valrin think he can take on something by himself like that? It was this, Melia said, holding up the vial containing Tritnu's ashes. Give me that, Evern shouted. As they began to sail upon the sea again, moving in haste toward eastern Rock Island, Misla began to move away from the island. The fleets of Morog were withdrawn, and as Misla moved west, the sun began to shine down upon the ocean, breaking through the dark clouds. Evern took the jar and poured out some of the ashes. The dust spun into an ethereal form and stared plainly at Evorn. What did you do? Evorn asked. Tritnu looked around. Where is Valrin? Gone, Ivium said. He is upon Misla alone. Tritnu closed his eyes and bowed his head into his hands. Then he defeated the demon just as he was meant to? Yes, just before he jumped on the ship, made a rather aggressive charge against the fleet of Morog, and flew straight up to the walls of the floating city, Ordak said. He didn't even tell us any form of plan, Evern said. And I could not see into his mind, Aviam added. Why did he block her out? What did you teach him? Tritnu stared at both of them. What? Do you not remember? Evorn asked. I remember my teachings and what I taught him. This doesn't make sense. You could not see into his mind, Evium? No, it was dark. She paused. It was like it wasn't him at all. He does not have the advanced powers of a Dwemhar, Tritnu said. I did not teach him the ability to block another from entering his mind from mortal beings. So immortal? Melia asked. Demons, spirits, I taught him to block those. You taught him something, Evern said. Now he's taken off away from his crew and those who can help him. For what? To die. Damn the gods and their workings. This is not what is supposed to happen. Tritnu sighed. No, Misla never should have been. Marog shouldn't have been. Evern stomped toward Tritnu, pointing a finger at him. You get your gods and rain down your holy magic or whatever you need to in order to protect him. You and your gods did this. It is your fault. 
Wait, EVM said. What if... She paused, biting her lip. What if he failed? Failed? Ordak asked. He slew the demon. We all saw it. But there was a chance of possession? Avim asked Tritnu. You taught him to keep a spirit away from him? He knew the words. Knew the words? Evan snarled. Knew the words? That's what you can tell me. Time was short. I was not given the time needed, but he did cast it once out of two attempts. They were drifting toward the fleet of the pirates hastily approaching. The turtle released its grip on the wheel, and the anchor slid into the ocean. I think I couldn't see into his mind because the demon was within him, blocking me, Avim said. Then why would he go to Misla? Why would he not seek help? Evern asked. The demon seeks beings of great power. He devoured many captains of Valrin's people. Valrin was meant to be a supreme being to the others, and the demon was only partially defeated. In the end, it was bound to the island until the time that the Stormborn would come here and face him in a final trial. Demons do not back down when they seek to devour the life force of a living being, Tritnu said. Unless there is something of greater power they desire, Avim said. Marag himself sought to take the power of my mother, just as the vengeful mother sought the same. Spirits of darkness desire a home and control over the vilest. Valrin is just a carrier, Milia said. The demon delivers him to Marog? Ordak asked. No, Evren said. The demon threatened us, gave Valrin the knowledge to captain the ship as he did, because the demon had absorbed the knowledge of the captains it devoured before him. If Valrin cast Hadradala, a part of his spirit was broken to land the killing strike, Tritnu said. But the demon knew this was coming from fighting Maro. From being nearly killed before, it learned. It waited. What do we do now? Ordak asked. Valrin's alone with Marog. What did Valrin say, anything? Tritnu asked. He said to prepare. He said Misla would warm the glacial seas as it moves toward the mainland. But we can't hope to stop what is essentially a devastator of the seas and land. Valrin told us what he could, Avim said. We should follow it. The demon would not allow him to divulge anything beyond what he did. I'm sure of it. He told us what to do. Perhaps he has a plan, even if he doesn't fully know what it is now. I will speak with the gods. We will see if there is anything that can be done. But do not put a stake in the gods. Tritnu vanished. Don't worry, I don't, Evern growled. The fleet of the pirates came alongside them, and among them, Mackley holding an owl. What has happened? he shouted. The Stormborn is gone. We must prepare. You have an owl of Okar, is that not? Evern asked. Yes, it looks quite weathered, Mackley said, pushing it to fly toward the Nakri. It must have been trying to get to the island for some time, though it took the storm blowing off and Misla departing. But Valrin is gone? Is that why Misla departs? Has he fallen? We do not know. Avaim shouted back. Nothing is certain now. Ivorn took the owl of Okar and noticed that there was a parchment in a small canister on his leg. He unrolled it, and those of the crew crowded around to read it. Avorn, I have received your message. There is much to speak of, I'm sure, but we cannot help you in the way you've asked. I know your correspondence was addressed to Fadis and Suvasel, but those lands have been cut off. The war is constant, and I have not even been able to reach the western Taria woodlands. But I have remembered more, and I see the horror unfolding in the night skies. I have heard of a monolith of stone above the far eastern oceans. I have seen such a thing before. At least that is what we called Ayaklo when we first saw it. I have knowledge that might be of use, a device like none other that perhaps the Stormborn can use if it is what I feel it is. I dare not tell you, but if you can get to me, I will happily tell you of it. I head to Srun, in the land these men call the North. I go there searching for what I've remembered. Just come to me. I will explain all I know, and if I'm right about what approaches our lands, 
We will need what I search for. Rungar. Avern rolled the parchment back up and sighed, looking at Avium. One thing is certain now we must prepare. We must warn the lands of the coming of Misla. If Rungar has remembered something, we should go to him. We have no other guidance, and I trust an amnesic Rusus over the hope in the gods. Avern looked at Ordak and Melia, picking up the dark compass and the eye of storms. I don't know why you did it, why you went alone, but I will do everything I can to help you. Part 8. Misla. Now you're here. You are in Misla. You will do as I say when I say. Valrin had sheathed his sword. He stared across a barren city street. The buildings were a pale green. The fog ahead was thick. I've done what you wanted. They are not of your concern anymore. Valrin could see nothing but the images of Evern, Milia, Ordak, and Aveum being gripped by the demon and torn apart slowly. You are right. They are gone. They are no doubt in shock at what action has been taken. They will be thrown asunder without my hand. At least, not my direct hand. The demon laughed. Misla is nearly within the realm. Its structures are strong, its appearance nearly its true form. You will walk from here and go to the central palace. As Valrin began to walk, he felt as if he was in a dream. His feet made no sound as he made his way up the street, coming to a large lake and looking upon a sight not too unlike something he had seen before. It looked just like Eliu's home, the Dwemar city he had gone to when they'd traversed time. Ahead of him, climbing into a dark sky, was a tower, the same tower they had visited when they were before the Grand Council of the Dwemhar. He focused on moving faster, and suddenly... He was standing in a dark throne room. There were braziers with blue fire at either side of a large black throne. In the shadows to his right and left, he saw masked forms staring out at him. A figure stood, looking out a large glass window. Valrin looked around and realized that he had been brought to a place high above Misla itself. Valrin, a voice said, come to me. Valrin knew that voice. His spine cringed, and he desired to draw his weapon. He scanned the masked ones standing around him and wondered if he could land a strike on Marog before they struck him. Go and do not! The demon caused a surge of pain in his arm. He couldn't have moved it to draw his sword if he wanted to. He began to walk, moving around the throne to where the figure stood. As the figure turned around... Valrin was not at all surprised to see who was before him. Marog, he said. You come here without your crew? Why? Why do something so careless? Valrin grimaced, trying to force the demon away from him. He tried to focus, to think of the words to pull the demon from himself. But he couldn't. He could only feel pain. He knelt. I come to serve the true Dwemhar, that which Eliu should have been. I, Stormborn, pledge my allegiance to Marog of Misla. Marog laughed. It is as all has been foreseen. It only took you understanding your place within your people. Now come, stand beside me. Valrin trembled, the demon forcing him to stand back up. He forced air out of his lungs, struggling to breathe. You were not injured, were you? Misla is open to you, and soon it will be within this realm just as you'd expect. This is as Iaclo was, what Iaclo was meant to be. Valrin looked out through the massive glass windows to see the city far beneath the tower, with grand crystalline buildings and shades of people walking through the city streets. Further down, he saw a grand harbor, and of all things, his ship, the Ayla Sunrise. It was with the rest of the fleet and a large number of ships stacked high with crystals. I bind your world with mine. From the death of one comes the life for our people. You were always meant to serve a greater purpose, Stormborn, and now you shall. 
Those who serve me and my masks contain the spirits of Dwemhar of old, those who died in the wars, those who could never ascend. Now they have their chance to return to life, and I have provided that. Valrin trembled, trying to grab his blade, desiring only to ram it into the back of Morag's skull. But the demon within him would not allow it. What do you ask of me, Morag? Valrin questioned. Morag laughed again. For now, nothing. But soon, you shall be the salvation to our people and the destroyer of that which has tainted our world. You are the captain of the Aella Sunrise, and you will indeed have your revenge, just not on me, for you now know the truth. All that would threaten us will be destroyed, and your ship shall sail upon the flood of their blood in the wake of what we bring together. Grab the next book here. Stormborn, Cataclysm, 